Atari announces mass layoffs. Time names the personal computer the machine of the year. And Nintendo launches the Game & Watch in North America. These stories and many oh so so many more on this episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to say this. Stop the presses. Requiescat in pace. Make some crazy money. What is a man? It's me, Mario. What a mess. Get over here! Please save me. <laughs> Welcome back to the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine, the show where we travel back in time to find out what was making headlines in the home computer and video game industries of yesteryear. Today we're going to be jumping back 40 years to February of 1983, and I'm joined by a very special everybody's favorite co-host, a first-timer in the position, but not an unknown quantity to listeners of this show, Alex Smith of They Create World's Fame. Welcome back to the show, Alex. Thanks. It's uh, great to be here for, for a normal episode <laughs> instead of one of our, uh, you know, 20-hour marathons. At least I'll, I'll try not to make this a 20-hour marathon. I know that's not the format. Uh, it's not the format, but considering that this is prime crash territory, <laughs> it's going to be one of those episodes, I'm afraid. <laughs> But this, this is, I know this is why he did that. It's like, I want Alex to guest stars, but I've got to get all of his crash talk out first. So now you can just be like, Alex, be quiet. We talked about this already. Moving on. <laughs> oh, quite the contrary. <laughs> I have you here basically to fill in all those gaps of stuff we wanted to talk about on the crash episode, but I was either falling asleep for <laughs> or... Uh, or we missed out on. So this is my way of basically extending the two-part crash episode even further. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> it's my master plan. I, I will get every ounce of content value out of the crash I can. So. <laughs> Nothing like a disaster to sell newspapers or or however it is podcasts get out into the world. It's it's well, it's the old lawyer instinct. I still think I'm getting paid by the hour. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> okay, so uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with your work, Alex, uh, give us the quick elevator pitch. Absolutely. Well, I do a lot of video game history and video game history content under the kind of brand or moniker of They Create Worlds. Uh, the flagship project there is the podcast that I do with my friend Jeffrey Dom twice a month, every month, without fail since September 2015. Sane people take breaks and do seasons. We don't believe in that. We believe in killing ourselves for you, the listener. Uh, so that's our main product. I'm also writing books on the history of the video game industry. I've done volume one of They Create Worlds, uh, the stories of the people and companies that shape the video game industry, uh, available from CRC Press and from major online retailers. Uh, a bit pricey because it's an academic work, but it's uh, one of the most in-depth looks at the very early years of the industry, kind of uh, prehistory up to 1982, uh, volumes two and three forthcoming eventually to uh, continue that story. And uh, then I also occasionally blog uh, at They Create Worlds as well, uh, though that's not kind of a regular thing. But all of that can be found at our website, theycreateworlds.com. And as somebody who has sung your praises many, 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 many times on this show, uh, yes, you, you are an inspiration and one of the main reasons why Video Game Newsroom Time Machine is a podcast. And not a blog, because that was the original plan. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I was, you're, you're to blame. I'm I'm so very sorry, dear listeners. <laughs> no, I, I love the video game newsroom time machine. I'm a proud patron myself. And uh, I'm happy that I could help inspire you because this is, you know, we kind of do deep dives on specific topics. And, and this complements that very nicely by, you know, giving that that month by month overview of what's going on. So. Exactly. And so, everybody, uh, if you're not already listening to a show, please go do that, because that's 
basically the first thing I listen to when there's a new episode that pops up. Everything else goes on pause until that's done. My wife has even accused me of having a man crush on you. Because I, <laughs> when I first discovered the show, you were about a year and a half in and I literally in about a span of a month caught up. It was – yeah, it was intense. So, uh, like I said, I was deep in development of this project when I discovered, wait, you can do a podcast that's not just reminiscing and talking about the good old days about retro <laughs> games? Awesome. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Let's get off this topic. We have a metric ton of stories to cover today uh, in all fields, and we need to get to them, but – before we can do that, first, the quick plug. Remember, everybody, you can follow us on all the socials. Uh, links are in the show notes below. And also follow us on Patreon, where you will get early access to our interview episodes. There's three of them up there right now. There's always three of them up there uh, that have not hit the main feed. They will hit the main feed at some point, but uh, you can always get early access there. Plus, you will also get... Uh, the video version of our first segment, the seven minutes in heaven, where the intrepid co-host must play a game that was reviewed in a magazine cover dated January of 1983 for, that they have not played before for seven minutes. Now we had a ton of big contenders, classic games that were genre defining in these early days of video games. We had Popeye by Nintendo, we had War of the Worlds, we had Sequest, and not the TV show, uh, Qbert, Adventureland came to the VIC-20 on cartridge, AD&D for the Intellivision, but there was only really one possible contender that was going to have the kind of hashtag worthiness that's going to maybe bring in some rand rando who has not heard the show before, and that was Spider-Man by Parker Brothers for the Atari 2600. So, Alex, are you ready to swing? Well, you you know what they say. Uh, those who can do, those who can't start a video game history podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's do it. Awesome. Welcome back, Alex, from your seven minutes in heaven. So, for the uninitiated, how would you describe Spider-Man uh, based on your seven minutes with the game? Absolutely. Um, well, you know, I'd never played it before. I'm certainly aware of it because I do the video game history thing. So I knew it was a crazy climber kind of clone in a way. And so that was very familiar when I started it up. It's like, okay, yes, this is Crazy Climber. The controls took a moment because I was trying to do it without reading instructions. But I did find the controls to be very nice. When you only have a joystick and a button, it's very hard to simulate feeling like Spider-Man. And, and uh, the programmer, uh, Laura Nikolic, did a, a really good job of creating a control scheme that made you feel like you were actually web slinging on that uh, building. Didn't get to have my big showdown with the green goblin. So can't speak on that, but uh, I'm, I liked it. Very cool. Very cool. Now uh, the mechanic of having to swing from one place to the other, obviously at this point we've seen pitfall uh, and several other games that have been using that, you know, extend the single pixel as far as you can on the uh, vertical um, axis. Now, you're using one button to extend it, and then you have to release the button at the right time so it attaches to part of the building, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Now, uh, that didn't work for you quite at the beginning. It took you a while to figure out what was attachable and what wasn't, correct? Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of had a sense that uh, you... You probably didn't want to touch the windows, that that, that was bad. But uh, working out the timing on that uh, took me a moment. Okay. Yeah, because it, it's not like it really goes up. It almost feels like it speeds up a little bit or there, mm -hmm. there's some kind of lag. Now, I wonder if that was actually designed into it or it's just basically the processor going, well, the first couple pixels are a little hard to calculate. And after that, it gets easier for it or something. It It is a little bit weird. Um, 
Okay, now this game, obviously Spider-Man games, there are a ton of them. Uh, Parker Brothers will not be the only licensee in these first couple years. Uh, there's going to be a text adventure Spider-Man game. Uh, at least, uh, did that, did the Quest Probe 1 actually come out or was it only planned? Um, I can't remember. No, I it think was it the, right. It, 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 well, or was it only the Fantastic Four and the Hulk that came out? No, no. Uh, the Hulk one comes out. The Fantastic Four one doesn't come out. Okay. And that was only the thing and the, and the human yes. torch. That's Correct. the one that doesn't make it. But yeah, Spider-Man makes it with Mysterio as the main villain. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on Moby Games right now checking it out. I, I, course, I interviewed Scott Adams for the Smithsonian. I should remember things like this. <laughs> and no, not that Scott Adams, for those of you keeping track of the news. <laughs> oh, oh, you're right. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes. We're recording this on the 27th of February. So, yes, it's it's not the racist tirade. Um uh, loony conspiracy theory, Scott Adams. It's the one who used to make text adventures. And is a very nice man. Oh, I'll believe it. That he's actually one of the guys I want to interview just because, I mean, he's like one of the first people to establish a proper video game publishing company. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, yeah, it's the kind of thing I should be interviewing about. Uh, but yes. So, uh, and you also said the Laura Nikolic, one of the very few female programmers at the time that's correct and it's kind of weird because this is the only game she's credited with making on moby games now granted she's uncredited in the game itself uh do you know anything more about her or yeah a little bit uh digipress did do an interview uh scott stilfen an interview with her back in the day which is still available on their website so there's a little more information there uh she did work on frogger 2 for the ColecoVision, okay. uh, as well and uh as well as two uh uncompleted games uh one called orbit and a care bears game interesting mm-hmm. okay and is there any and do we know why she left the industry I'm sure we probably do. Obviously, you know, Parker Brothers got rid of everybody. <laughs> no, and that's true, yeah. And then I, I think her career just took her in other directions. Uh, she went uh, to work for a company called GCI Designs on a graphic generator, so using the, the graphic training uh, and the graphics experience. And then after that, uh, moved on to Wang and... Then became a stay-at-home mom. So, yeah, I think it was just one of those things. The industry vanished, and and she didn't really have an opportunity to get back in. Uh, too bad, actually. Too bad. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at her. 1976, bachelor's degree in engineering technology from University of South Florida. Learned assembly. Uh, worked on pager technology for Motorola, according to Wikipedia, at least. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of person that... Would have been interesting to see what they could have pulled off because, like you said, the game really does implement the Spider-Man technology or feeling probably as good as you were going to get. And many others failed probably until Neversoft uh, came out with their Spider-Man game. So, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So would you recommend the game to others? I would. If you're interested in, in the old school uh, retro 2600 kind of games, I think this is a very solid entry. Excellent. Well, you have it there, people. From an expert, you should try this. Okay. And I I didn't give the recommendation, so don't send me any hate mail. Now. uh, (laughs) Way to stand behind your guests, Carl. (laughs) I stand behind them so that the bullets hit them first. It's called a human shield, people. Uh, (laughs) Okay. Uh, One last thing before we turn on the time machine and look back at all the news from publications cover dated Feb- uh, in February of 1983, we need to check in with our good friend Ethan for the Department of Corrections. Hello, this is a prepaid collect call from... 
the Department of Corrections. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. To accept charges, press 1. You may start the conversation now. Welcome back, Ethan. Hello! It's the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. Here we are at WDOC. I'm Ethan Johnson. I'm here with Carl Curris. How are you doing, Mr. Carl? So, uh, your lifelong dream of becoming a radio, a morning drive time radio This is WDOC. Is... Don't you turn that dial. We've got loads of corrections for you. Is this where I become the uh, funny sidekick with a horn? Yeah, something like that. Honk, honk. There we go. Is everybody laughing now? I would appreciate it if everybody was laughing right about now. Yeah, because that's totally how humor works. Exactly. (laughs) I would have thought so, Carl. And you would have thought so. Though I am the sound effects guy as well. Uh, There there you go. There you go. (laughs) So, So, today. We had, well, the last episode, this episode, January 1983. We had John on. All right, John. <laughs> Something like that. And I, I can't come up with sound effects on the fly. What do you What do you think I am? I don't have no soundboard, no Foley equipment <laughs> down in front of me. Uh, hi, John. There's a comment. All right, out to the Department of Corrections. Are you ready, Carl? I'm ready. Okay. First of all, st- Carl, you go back and forth on this. You keep saying the crash has happened. No, the crash is happening, Carl. It is not a singular event. World War II didn't happen in 1939. This is true. This is true. The Atari the ba- the Atari big bad news has happened, but the crash is ongoing. This is true. Yes. And the thing is, you kept going back and forth anyway, so stick to stick to one of your stories, Carl. <laughs> I like of course, to think for this next history episode, is multiple choice. For this next episode, I'm not going to have nearly as much to say because Alex is there on the ground to help me out. But as we're here, let's go through the rest of these for a long, good episode, January 1983. Next up, we have... The name of the show you were looking for is Saturday Supercade. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thought of it uh, right after that we were done with the episode. Yeah, but as always, a lot of people say Donkey Kong had a cartoon. No, it was part of a cartoon block in Saturday Supercade. Together with that amazing Qbert show. Mm, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amazing. Those are the words I would use to describe Saturday Supercade. (laughs) Hey, On was... the subject of cartoon uh, studios, though, Dragon's Lair was not done by Rankin Bass. It was done by Ruby Spears. Wait, Very true. Wait. Yes, that's right. They did. They they did that. I've learned a lot recently about uh, early uh, animation studios, um, and I also have. I know the amount that they that uh, Ruby Spears paid for the Dragon's Lair license. In fact, it was the first license of Dragon Slayer. Really? Yes, because and what did uh, they pay part, for it? Uh, it was it was pretty small. I think it was like five thousand advance or fifty thousand advance, something like that. Um, and then they got you know they get uh, amount per uh, aired episode and whatnot. And of course, it took a long time to develop because no one knew it existed until it was out. True. Nobody outside the coin up industry. Okay, technically, it's not, that's not true. It's, they, it was not the first license. The first license was to Coleco. That's the money they used to uh, construct Dragon Slayer. But then the first license after it was released was to Ruby Spears. That's cool. Yeah, and I uh, believe, uh, oh, the business guy, not Don Bluth, but the other guy, uh, what's his name? Rick Dyer. Rick Dyer, yeah, said in an interview that uh, that TV show probably did more for keeping the longevity of the game alive than anything else, or at least the memory uh, of the game alive. Uh, not agreeing there. But also, speaking of Ruby Spears, I'm pretty sure you said the studio of Ru- Ruby Spears originated Scooby-Doo, and they did not. 
No, I yeah, it was not the studio. It was Ruby and Spears. At Hanna-Barbera with other people. So Well, yeah. obviously, yeah. There's always more people involved, but at the end of the day, those are the two guys giving credit for the creation of the series. They didn't do the. Uh, ca- they didn't make the characters. That was a guy named Iwao Takamoto. Yeah, yeah, and that would be also like. Uh, but I mean, you have to come up with the general concept to begin with. Anyone could come up with a concept, Carl. Just ooh, like anyone could have come ooh, up with a concept. Ooh. Yes, yes, it is absolutely true. Yeah, anyone could have come up with the concept of going year by year through video game magazines, but you did it. You took your concept and you made something. Exactly. And it's it's the old, you know, Columbus's egg story. You know, how do you balance an egg and oh, everybody's trying to do it and Columbus goes ahead and just takes the egg and cracks it a little bit so it sits and everybody's like, well, we could have done that. It's like, yeah, but I did it. And they... Did it? They came up with the concept. Well, I mean, if you're going to talk about um, accrediting people for things they didn't do, I mean, I guess that's a good parable enough for anything. <laughs> Next up, John Madden in his advertisement for CES, he was not making games for CBS, is which is what you said. Well, yeah, because they were reported as there was going to be a John Madden game. Obviously, yeah, he's not making the game, but uh, well, he didn't even have any involvement with that game. He was just a spokesman. Well, and that's the weird thing. I I kind of get the feeling that the Roden report I found about there was going to be a John Madden game may have just been conflating the, the fact that he was going to be a spokesman for CBS Software. No, the John Madden football game was going to come out. Oh, okay. Do yeah, we have? I did some research on this. Uh, it's not definitive whether or not it like they lost the license, and got changed to another game. But for a long time in the video game magazines, John Madden Football was a game that was coming to ColecoVision. Interesting. Okay, cool. You can link my Twitter thread, which I already sent to you, so I don't know why you didn't read it in the <laughs> the description. I, it's been a very very busy couple of days, but I will definitely include it in the show notes. Then. Sewer Shark was indeed directed by John Dykstra, Mr. Special Effects Man on Star Wars. Cool. Yeah, I wasn't sure anymore, but yeah, the name sounded familiar. On the subject of Star Wars, both Ewok Adventure and Lord of the Rings both have existing prototypes that have been dumped on the web. Very cool. They're not that interesting of games, but, uh, you know, for everything's a first for something. There, there you go. I mean, the Ewoks. Who doesn't want to play as an Ewok? Mm. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, <laughs> now corporate shenanigans. Magnavox was not bought by Philips. They were bought by North American Philips, which is a legally distinct company. Alex would talk your ear off about this if you yes. uh, if you let him. He will. Then, Imagic was not just Atari people, it was also Mattel people. It was about equally founded by Atari and Mattel people. That's true, that's true. And I knew that, and I don't know why I blanked completely. Now, home video. Everybody loves home video. Betamax, you did not need two tapes to hold a movie on Betamax. You could hold two yeah. hours. Yeah. Well, it, uh, in later formats. Uh, actually... Uh... Since we're recording this slightly out of order, Alex and I kind of started to do a dive into this. Uh, apparently, there's very a, a large variation of beta formats, and yeah, that... I'm not sure at what point chronologically the different formats came out. I believe that the original uh, the original version of Betamax could do two hours, and the original version of VHS could I, it do somewhere between three and four yeah. as a basic. Record from TV um, style. Yeah, and this is why I found a a list of all the different Betamax versions, and there were a bunch of them that were under 30 minutes or f- uh, under 40 minutes. Those were probably specialized Tie-Fi stuff. It was not the original one. I definitely know the original one was over an hour, and I'm pretty sure it was ba- it was two hours. Okay, cool. Next, to the story of Gary Kildall. 
So the yeah. the contentious story of of Gary Kildall, whether or not he quote unquote blew off the IBM people, is very contested. Both he and his unpublished memoirs, as well as his right hand man at Digital Research, uh, have a different story that uh, they did in fact engage with IBM. That they, you know, they did everything to drop and uh, talk about it. Uh, the problem was that IBM kept asking for more and more and more in terms of what they could not do. And so that's why they turned down the offer to do the uh, OS for IBM. Hmm. Yeah, and the the only reason I use the story about the airplane flight is that, um, oh, what's his name uh, from uh, Computer Chronicles? Uh, Chavay? Chavay. Stuart Chavay. Yeah. Stuart Chaffee, he actually repeats that story in interviews. And so I'm willing to give that some credence since he was good friends with him. And if he's repeating that story, I'm I'm willing to I guess it's coming from the horse's mouth. I'm not saying opinion. that there weren't discussions, but that that particular meeting or the final meeting does get blown off for that. In, in my opinion, that is him being influenced by the historical narrative that's been picked up by other people. And maybe in terms of Kildall specifically, it wasn't that important. Because the thing is, a lot of people, uh, this segues into the next point, a lot of people uh, pin Kildall, uh, he became an alcoholic uh, because, because of this deal. And I don't know so much about him personally to know whether or not that is true. Um, but that is a convenient narrative to try and put somebody into a box of, uh, and I think that that's why it it is appealing. And like I said, a guy who was there also repeats Kildall's story independently. Okay. So that, yeah, his right hand man, at digital research, uh, but on the point of him, uh, having a tragic later life, he did not die of alcoholism. He died because he got an brain injury in a ballroom brawl, which may have had something to do with alcoholism. May have had something to do with alcohol? I don't know. It could, like, you know, some people can just be evil, evil, you know, dirtbags, so. This is true. This is true. But, you know, it it, it is definitely not what you'd say. It, in marketing or in PR terms, you would call it uh, bad optics. Whatever the case, I'm not going to try and uh, do the psychoanalyzing, like I said. So, but he did not die go. of alcoholism. This is true. Next, Apple II was on sale since 77. I think you said 78 or 79. Yeah, I may have been off on the year, yeah. Then David H. All's book, its name was 101 Basic Computer Games. Basic in all caps, because basic programming language. Yep. Then uh, you were making a point about uh, cal- uh, about a something with a cartridge. What was it? it was a phone or something with a cartridge or, or something? Oh, like yeah, that. it was a phone that was using cartridges uh, for different uh, types of information. Like, you could have a cartridge with your phone numbers, a cartridge with uh, birth dates, and stuff like that. Okay, so. Uh, and you said that goes back to the Channel F, but in fact, there is a predecessor to the Channel F and actually where they got the idea for the cartridges on the Channel F, and it's probably more analogous to this. There used to be tiny little cartridges that you could fit into certain calculators as well. Oh. Um, they were not, you know, in a full plastic body constructed like that, but they were plug-in electronic devices that you could put inside of a calculator to give it extra functionality. Gotcha. Cool. Bit of ROM to shimmy up. A ROM. Mm, indeed. <laughs> All right. Then to the birth of the internet, which might be technically true in terms of the uh, the environment that we exist in today, but in terms of the inter you know the internet means interoperable networks. There before TCP/IP. The ARPANET could talk to some of the other existing standards in Europe through different standards. I can't remember exactly what the name of those are, but technically there was an internet 
before TCP IP. Okay. No, well, there's there were networks before that. Yes, that's true. Well, no, uh, but yeah, but this is an interoperable network that works on different standards. It's just before they weren't trying to. Well, I mean, they technically were always trying to find a universal standard. That was part of the job of the ARPANET. Um, mm. But no, the people in Europe were, weren't going to adopt that, so they put a higher level thing that all of these things can talk to, and that was TCP/IP. Gotcha. Lastly, the 3D platformer you were trying to talk about was Jumping Flash, not Jumping Jack Flash. That is a song by the Rolling Stones. Yes, and also a Whoopi Goldberg movie. All right. Yeah, I vaguely, uh. vaguely recall that. <laughs> okay, it's... this has been WDOC. Thank you for joining us this evening. Carl, do you have anything left to say to the viewers? Uh, remember, people, to uh, make sure you stay cool out there or something. Eat like your that. vegetables, Not... kids. Eat All your right. vegetables, yeah. <laughs> See you next time. As always, thank you for your service. Yeah, you know, that, that Phillips thing, I really can't blame you for that one, because I was doing that wrong for a long time, too. I'm I'm actually the one, I believe, that that actually informed Ethan uh, about that, because I only just realized it, that there was a trust in everything. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that one. I think it's still wrong on Wikipedia at the time of this recording, so. <laughs> uh, there's so much that's wrong, but hey, we'll talk about things that were wrong on Wikipedia um, a little bit later in the show, since uh, we, we <laughs> just fixed something, or you fixed something yesterday, so. Uh, okay. With that being said, it's time to turn on the time machine, but we're not going back 40 years first, because first we have to head back 50 years to February of 1973. Traditional Welcome back to February of 1973. Alex, What's our first story? Pong gets more notices. Following up on our brief mention of Pong by a California distribute, a distributor, last month in Cashbox magazine, a Pong machine has appeared in an L.A. mall according to a Detroit newspaper article. It's not much, but you know, hey, hey. Well, no, and uh, the interesting thing is this, uh, this mall was... That orange mall, that is actually an Atari-owned and operated arcade. Really? I did not know Atari was operating arcades at this point. They did. They opened a couple of them in 1973. You know, they had had a coin route uh, from the very early days. Um, True. But, I mean, that coin route was placing on, on locations that already existed. Uh, but in early 73, they opened their first couple of arcades, one in... Northern California, one in Southern California. And, uh, yeah, that Orange Mall arcade is actually them. Okay. Uh, and I've got to ask if, if you have any insight, because I haven't talked to Bushnell yet, but uh, the the whole idea of operating arcades, is does that somehow lead directly to the founding of Chuck E. Cheese, or is it just sort of coincidence that they were doing both? Right. I mean, I don't think it leads directly to that other than – um, of course, Chuck E. Cheese is also an arcade, but they were they were looking for those kinds of opportunities. And I don't really know if that's, you know, Bushnell's instincts from essentially being an operator back when he was at the amusement park or what. But it's definitely true that I think a lot of entrepreneurs saw the shopping mall arcade and the video game as kind of hand in hand with each other, uh, helping each other. Uh, Aladdin's Castle, as they opened new locations, really emphasized, of all things, computer space. It was actually Ethan that first found this by trolling through mm. newspapers.com. Um, every article about a new Aladdin's Castle opening in some small town somewhere would mention the computer space. And you know it wasn't 
the reporter for this little newspaper that was hitting on that, you know it was the PR person from Aladdin's Castle being like, and look at this amazing thing here. Be sure to write about that. Because arcade games had a bad rap. Shopping malls wanted good, respectable businesses. And the video game kind of offered something that was a a definitive break from the sort of seedy past of coin-op with slot machines and pinball machines and bars and pool halls and all of these kind of places. So it's it's probably taking advantage of some of that synergy is why Atari opened a couple of shopping mall arcades to help push their product. And it would also explain why this article, and remember everybody, uh, links to all the articles that we're talking about are in the show notes so you can read it yourself. But there's, they actually talk about, you know, the creators of the game were sissigy. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, there's no way that they would have made that connection if it hadn't been an Atari owned arcade. Exactly. Somebody is definitely talking it up. Okay, cool. Uh, we got one more quick notice before we uh, jump to the 40 years. Odyssey gets right up in Popular Electronics. Popular Electronics, the go-to magazine for electronics fans, has a half-page write-up on the Magnavox Odyssey, briefly describing the use of the machine. Exciting stuff. Yeah. There you go. It's it says it does what it says on the tin. It's really a very simple, quick little article. You know, you hook it up to any yeah. TV. Very clear. Yeah. They're very clear on any TV, uh, and you manipulate stuff on the screen, and you put overlays on it to be fields and whatnot. Yep. The the other thing that I found interesting, it's a minor point, but that's what we historians do, is they're very clear to emphasize that you can keep the the cord that hooks it up to your RF, you can keep that cord there all the time and just unplug your Odyssey when you're done with it and leave the cord attached. And I just think that's interesting because, of course, back then, you didn't have all of the add-ons and peripherals, didn't even have VCRs for your television. So, like, you didn't have, like, a cabinet or a piece of furniture or something that you kept your electronic devices in. So they assume that people would, and they're probably correct, would be plugging in and unplugging their Magnavox Odyssey instead of leaving it hooked in all the time. That's very true. Yeah. I, I, you know, when I, and when I saw that, I was like, okay, now I need to see a picture of the Odyssey again to see exactly what that hookup looked like Mm -hmm. to be able to put it in perspective, especially, I mean, the easiest way to do this would be put uh, Put the Odyssey on top of the console, uh, the television. Mm-hmm. But the problem with that, of course, is then you've got the cords dangling down in front. And a lot it's, of people still had antennas on their televisions as well. And so oh, that, yeah. would, that would get in the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think most people world. just put it on the floor in front of their televisions. Uh, I mean, that's what all the pictures always show is people putting it on yeah. the floor in front of their television. Now, but the Odyssey runs kind of hot, doesn't it? Wouldn't I mean, surprise me. I, I mean, just uh, just, uh, and I don't know this for a fact. I'm just thinking from the type of electronics that it's using. That's not something I'd probably want on shag carpeting for too long. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. The '70s being the '70s. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, you know, it's like, uh, and it's all man-made fibers, so you know that stuff's gonna burn. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, well. Okay, enough reminiscing about the 70s. It's time to go forward. Turn on the time machine again, and let's head back to February of 1983. Business has dropped in half of the past 1983. year. 1983. types of games and businesses like sex. Welcome to February of 1983. Alex, what's our first story? Well, we're going we're gonna to have to to make a mini jump here mm, real fast because we're we're actually going to take a moment to recognize that in January of 1983, Al Lowe enters gaming biz. That's right. We missed this one last month, and I was not going to pass up the chance to talk about it. So, Sunnyside Soft has released their first two titles: Dragon's Keep and Bapa Bet. The two educational titles are the brainchildren of the two couples that formed the company, 
Of course, the important bit here is that they showed the games at Apple Fest in San Francisco. One Ken Williams saw them, snapped up the rights for his company, Sierra Online, and, well, main programmer Al Lowe went on to make many games that were very, well, educational. So... Pretty much. Uh, Al Lowe, friend of the show, first interview that I ever did on the show. Uh, The one of, if not my favorite game designer of all time, uh, as a diehard Leisure Suit Larry fan, Freddie Farkas, and so on and so forth. Uh, And also somebody who spent way, way too much time at an age that was way inappropriate playing Donald Duck's Playground. Which I still contend, <laughs> at least on the C64 version, is still an amazing game. Highly recommend it if you haven't played it. Uh, yeah, no, this uh, he's awesome, he's great, and this is where he gets in. And InfoWorld has a great little write-up on it, primarily because, you know, it's three educators. Um, uh, three of the four people are educators, you know, making this and, you know, people who live in the same neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of the story. But it's already clear that it's all about Al because he's the pretty much the only one who gets cited in there. He's also the main programmer and so on and so forth. So, And he's also the only one of the four who ends up staying at Sierra for any length of time. But, mm-hmm. okay, yes. Let's move on to February then. Absolutely. And, oh, look, it's our good friend, the video game crash, Atari Profits Nosedive as Coleco Ascends. Atari's fourth quarter profits for 1982 dropped from $135.6 million in 1981 to just $1.2 million. Yes, $135 million to $1.2 million. $35 million of the loss was a write-off from Warner selling its Knickerbocker toy division to Hasbro, but the majority comes from losses in their coin-op and console businesses. Coleco, on the other hand, saw their fourth quarter profit skyrocket from a loss of $661,000 in 1981 to a profit of $15.4 million in 1982. Talk about ships passing in the night there, huh? <laughs> yeah, geez. I mean, just the numbers are so staggering. I mean, granted, you know, it's Coleco is right in the Coleco vision at this point. You know, it's yep. They, they, it's there's a lot of money in selling that console, but at the same time, it's 1.2 million in profit. It's it's nothing to sneeze at. But holy crap in a hat, is that a drop? Yep, they just, uh, you know, as, as we talked about in the crash episode, they just had all of that inventory back up. So even though they sold a lot of games at Christmas, it's not like they didn't sell games. They just had so many more sitting around. And so that, uh, that'll do away with your profits in a big hurry right there. Yeah, and let's face it, a lot of the games that they had were just not that good. Little, little, little ET, uh, little Raiders. Yeah, I, was... I know. So, I know some people like Raiders, but no, eh. no. I'm sorry. The moment you have to pick up that second joystick to manage your inventory yeah. that doesn't have suction cups on it. If it had just had suction cups, okay. <laughs> this was one of the beautiful things of a lot of those weird joysticks we had on the C64. They had suction cups. You plop that, ba- yep. that bastard down, and then it didn't matter that you had to use the space bar for your bombs or something. You could play the game. But, okay, I, I digress. That's that's <laughs> another issue entirely. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I mean, Coleco's riding high at this point. At, at this point, it looks like it may very well just be an Atari slash Mattel crash and, and not a video game crash because, uh, you know, Coleco's riding high. Uh, you'll soon be reporting Activision trumpeting their success as well. Um, but, of course, uh, as we know, uh, what's going up there is also eventually going to come crashing down. Exactly. Well, and we're going to see that some people may have already seen the writing on the wall, as we'll see in a later story. But okay, <laughs> moving on with crash-related news. Yes, next we have Atari lays off 1700. The repercussions of Atari's loss of market share and subsequent stock crash have begun to hit the rank and file at the company. 
Atari has announced mass layoffs in its manufacturing operations in North, Northern California, and Atari will be moving manufacturing of consoles, computers, and games to Taiwan and Hong Kong in an effort to reduce its costs. Atari claims that the loss of market share and the share collapse was not the reason for the change. That is actually, in part, quite true. Uh, this is something that they had had in the works for a while. I mean, everyone was kind of going offshore. This is kind of the beginning of, of major offshoring. There had been offshoring in the past. Mattel was already offshore from the start of their operations. But, uh, you know, this is kind of early days in that. And a lot of it was getting the computer manufacturing over there because they were really getting hit, you know, in the price wars. was better believe Commodore wasn't manufacturing in the United States. And uh, so they didn't completely get rid of their North American manufacturing at this point. They had a plant in California. They had a plant in El Paso, Texas. Uh, and then they had one in Puerto Rico as well. And they were had already been planning throughout 1982 to shift a lot of that California manufacturing of consoles and computers over to uh, Atari Taiwan and uh, the partnership that they had, uh, Atari Wong, in Hong Kong. And a lot, most of the cartridge manufacturing at this point, which remembers, of course, where they're experiencing the majority of their really bad losses, uh, was still going to be in North America at this point, in El Paso and in Puerto Rico. So I, I really think they're telling the truth. Some of this is terrible timing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, these won't be the, the last manufacturing layoffs uh, we see. And uh, let's just say that even though those El Paso and Puerto Rico plants were not affected this time, uh, they may be uh, starring in a future installment of The Time Machine. Oh, definitely, definitely. And a uh, friend of the show, Kevin Hayes, uh, he's coming over to help set up a manufacturing uh, setup right around this time in Texas, which is, of course, not going to uh, come to pass. So uh, <laughs> check that out. Uh, in, the interview with him is all in linked in the show notes, people. Okay. So uh, one more side effect of the crash before we move on. Editors plead not to give up on games. A recurring theme this month in publications, both industry ones such as Toy and Hobby World and Replay, as well as consumer-level ones such as the Video Game Update, is that despite the glut of bad product and voices proclaiming the end of games, gaming is here to stay, and those buying games and hardware must be wary of just purchasing something that looks flashy for fear of buying something from a company that may not be there in six months or is spent more on a license than on game development. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it'll, it'll get better, we promise, they say, because... They all need the home video game. You know, the arcade's in the slump already, and if the home market goes down as well, they're scared. The traditional toy industry was in a real decline in this period, and the video game industry was gobbling up more and more of that, which did not make a lot of people in the toy industry happy. But at the same time, they could see Armageddon uh, coming if this fell apart too quickly. Uh, of course, they got lucky that, uh, you know, things like uh, G.I. Joe and Cabbage Patch uh, came along the relaunched GI Joe uh, and Cabbage Patch Masters came along right universe. as this was GI Joe and seems of course, to be the number one the for eighty two, but eighty three is all going to be He Man. He Man, absolutely. No, those those three toys kind of led to a revival of the traditional toy business at a very opportune moment uh, when the video games were collapsing. But you know, these publications had a lot of stake, obviously in in this thing not falling, falling apart. So they basically wanted to tell everybody, don't panic. Don't panic, yeah. And everyone's response was, I'm not panicking, you're panicking. And then everyone <laughs> was panicking. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, it's just kind of weird. It hit me really this month. I mean, obviously with publication dates, everything is a little bit delayed. Everybody is mm. – they've probably heard things, but by the time you get – and this is obviously one of the problems with the – or one of the features, if you will, of the format of this uh, show. We use the cover dates. So things are a little staggered. It's sometimes the news in like the New York Times almost seems like it's from the future 
when stuff is happening this yes. quickly. There's a ton of magazines this month that are for the first time are reporting the news from December that Atari, mm-hmm. you know, had a had a a bad time of it. Uh, <laughs> whereas their January <laughs> issues were like everything looks hunky dory and ET is a great game. It actually got positive reviews from some people. It's like, did you That's play true. the same game? Did you really? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, if, if you guys go back through the archive, look for the time when uh, uh, I can't remember. I think it was Game Players or uh, EGM, one of those magazines in their early issues, uh, tested the co- the first Commodore 64 port of Double Dragon. There were two. <laughs> and if you've never played the original Melbourne House Double Dragon port, well, you probably shouldn't. But if you do, <laughs> oh my lord, it is terrible on a level that is hard to understand. But they gave it a glowing review because as opposed to the NES version, it has a two-player mode. Why you would want to Disclaimer. subject another oh, person to that is another issue entirely. But yeah, hey. <laughs> Disclaimer, the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine does not endorse the playing of the original Double Dragon port by Melbourne House and cannot be held responsible for any ill effects you may experience by playing the original Double Dragon port by Melbourne House. (laughs) Dude, that was brilliant. That was so brilliant. (laughs) No, seriously, have you ever seen this? Oh, oh, no, I... I... You have to play it. It's... I've heard you talk about it, but I have not experienced. Oh, oh you it. need you need to play it. It's 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 that bad. It is uh, that bad. It's <laughs> okay. All I have to say is they're they're using multiple sprites for each character, and the timing is not done right. So there's actually a, an invisible line who's separating oh, the no. top of the body from the bottom of the body. <laughs> The waist oh, is basically dear. an invisible line where you can see the background through it. It's it's yeah, it's bad. <laughs> okay, now uh, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> next headline. Let's move on. It's, 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 sorry, I'm uh, old, absolutely old scars are coming back. I I understand. Uh, Atari snags Intel microchip luminary. Thank you for correcting that. <laughs> Uh, and I, I'm probably going to kill the pronunciation of this. Uh, Marcian Hoff? Is, is it? Probably. Marcian. I, I can't speak with certainty, yeah, M- but that's, that's how I would M-A-R-C-I-A-N. try it. M-A-R-C-I-A-N. It's either that or Martian, whichever comes first. But probably Marcian. Marcian Hoff, credited with the idea of creating a universal computer chip as opposed to customized circuits, has left Intel to join Atari. He will stay with the company until 1984, a very long tenure. Indeed. Well, you know, I, something something happened. Uh, I think it was in July of 1984. Uh, you, you, you'll, you'll hear about it in, uh, in a year or so. Yeah, yeah. You'll hear a little bit. Yeah, it. Uh, we'll talk about it. <laughs> uh, or you can also check out my interviews with Leonard Trammell. He will also talk about that incident a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting um, because Atari, there's this idea of Atari that kind of it started with Steve Bloom's uh, article in Video Games from Cutoff to Pinstripes, and it moved through interviews with people like Al Alcorn, and it moved through Stephen Kent's book. There's this idea about Atari that Ray Kassar took over and R&D just went away. It was gone. No more R&D. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, What I would say, though, is that the the R and D lost a lot of focus, lost a lot of direction, and the move from blue sky research to practical product became kind of iffy. But Ray Kassar was interested in creating and staffing a large R and D operation, and he was interested in getting really big names to be a part of it. Alan Kay. Uh, spent a period of time as the head of R and D at Atari, and then they they brought in uh, Ted Hoff, Martian uh, or Marcian is his uh, real first name. He went by Ted or goes by Ted. He's still alive. Uh, 
didn't accomplish much. Uh, like Alan Kay has said in, in interviews that that was the least productive period of his professional career was the time he spent at Atari. Uh, mm. But they were doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes with virtual reality. A lot of the virtual reality stuff that's out there today actually started at Atari. No kidding. Um, and uh, they were doing speech recognition stuff. They were doing uh, video phone stuff. Uh, and that's that's how Ted got in there is he was kind of he had been working in because uh, he had left Intel and he had been working in uh, telephony and in uh speech recognition and mm. some of this stuff and that's what attracted him to atari uh, according to the the very little <laughs> that he has said on that time period uh in his life so uh however uh it, it was interesting uh when you put this uh in the show notes because i i discovered a little something uh as a result of this because you see there's there's actually another ted hoff who was involved in the video game industry whose first name was actually theodore uh, Theodore M. Hoff, who was a marketer uh, and a brand manager who joined uh, Time Warner Interactive and then joined uh, Fox Interactive. Uh, this was all in the 90s, the height of Sillywood, uh, and then was briefly at uh, Tramel's Atari Corporation and then moved on uh, to be with Sega for a spell. Uh, well, it turns out somebody uh, who was editing Wikipedia uh, saw a notice in, I guess, GamePro, because that's what they cited as the source, uh, saying that Ted Hoff had left Atari and joined Sega. And so putting two and two together and and getting like 50, <laughs> uh, they saw, oh, Ted Hoff left Atari in 1995. That must be the same Ted Hoff who joined Atari in 1983. And it's not. It's not the distinguished <laughs> inventor of the microprocessor. And yes, Ethan, I know lots of different people working at the same time. He had teammates. It's fine. Don't worry about it. But uh, <laughs> one of the people that can lay the claim to inventing the microprocessor, at the very least, uh, you know, certainly did not hang around to, to work with, with Jack Trammell. I mean, no, no offense to the fine people at Atari Corporation, and I know Leonard's a friend of the show, but can you imagine Ted Hoff working for Jack Trammell? Uh, yeah, no. That, that, <laughs> let me put it this way. The, there's no way when Trammell takes over – and and Leonard was also very very open about this. the The money mm -hmm. was so tight. The R and D was basically reduced to zero. Everything right. had to be as off the shelf as possible, and fast and furious. I mean, the Atari ST. If you look at it, I mean, there's not a lot of custom silicon in that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's there's no way that they would have been able to number one use him in any kind of real capacity uh and yes yeah when when you mentioned that to me and i had originally put this in my notes i just took it on face value and i was like my my instinct was it had to have been atari games that warner kept right. him on and he was maybe doing chip design for the arcade division that would have made some level of sense Sure, I, I can see that. Uh, it would have still been a little far fetched, but I was like, okay, why not? You know, he had a contract. Ex <clears throat> exactly. But yeah, when I saw that in your show notes, because that wasn't a page I was watching on Wikipedia, when I saw it in your show notes, I was like, no. <laughs> and then I saw that you uh, had a link in, in, in your notes to the, to the Wikipedia article. So I clicked on that and saw that, and I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it also spread, uh, Wikipedia did it first, but then it also spread from there to Sega Retro. Uh, which was originally correct because they have an article on the marketer Ted Hoff because he worked at Sega of America. And their article was originally correct when it was created. But uh, a year or so ago, somebody clearly saw the Wikipedia article and then added the bad information to the Sega Retro uh, article as well. And so, yeah, I, I went in and I, I corrected both of those because it, it was conflating the two it, it, in uh, Martian Hoff's article. It was saying, uh, and then he worked at Atari till 1995. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he, yeah, he's, he starts working at a consulting firm that was giving evidence on patent cases and the like uh, in 1990. So, yeah. And, you know, we uh, Carl and I were discussing this. Uh, no one's talked to him about that, that gap that I know of. I mean, he mentions in one interview that that Carl, I'll give all credit to to tracking down uh, that, that he was bought out uh, of his Atari contract in 1984. 
my guess is that the reason that uh, it was not until 1990 that he resurfaces in in the corporate world again is that he was under a non-compete still from his original contract because the the original Atari uh, people, when they sold out to Warner, they were given seven year non-competes. That's why uh, Nolan Bushnell founded Sente in 1983 is that's when his uh, non-compete ran out from from when he signed uh, you know the deal with them. And uh, so if he was also given a seven year non-compete, you know, that that timing rough, that timing works out because it's a seven year non-compete from when you're hired, not yeah. when you leave. So uh, 1983 to 1990, that would be uh, if that was Warner's standard non-compete, that would make sense. Yeah, the, and and the fact that in none of the material I've been able to find his official bio on that old company and whatever else. There's simply no mention of that gap whatsoever, mm -hmm. and that's got to be it. Uh, there's no other yeah. explanation for it. Okay, so speaking of Atari uh, and non-competes, and you kind of already hinted at it. Yes, indeed. Showbiz turns Apple II's into coin ops. Chuck E. Cheese rival Showbiz Pizza has introduced their Computer Fun Fair, F-A-I-R terminals, which look like a regular arcade game at first glance, but in reality house Apple II computers with custom games. Each token buys a player four minutes with a game they can choose from a list, and the control panel is a keyboard. So, it's, I guess, one yeah. way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, this is not a project I really know much about, uh, but just putting on my general historian hat, we have to remember that CoinOp is in ridiculous decline at this point, and computers and computer games are in something sort of like ascendancy uh, at this point. So I can see why uh, a place like Showbiz, which is catering, of course, towards younger kids, not not the score chasing crowd uh, that's uh, flocking to the the arcades. I can see why they might want to experiment with this because it's 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 getting bad in in coin op and certainly coin op itself. Uh, I think is is we'll continue talking about here because they're in such a panic with their traditional market is also uh, trying to like get at that younger audience because they need to to find people somewhere so this this kind of really leads right into our next headline if you think about it. <laughs> it it does it does and i just want to mention before we do move on to that uh yeah the idea of trying to go for the younger demographic is going to be a theme we're going to see many many times today in all the different areas and i i think you're right that the they're desperately trying to do something in last month in our last 40 year jump when we had our ces reports coming in one of the big things mm -hmm. that mainstream media like New York Times were jumping on was it's all about computer software. Everybody's going into computer software. It really does feel like that trend that we've been talking about for the last four years on the show since its inception of consoles are just a stepping stone into computers is finally going to happen. But yes. Mm. Okay. You're right. Let's move on to the next one. That's right. Uh, more kid stuff here because Kitty Rides – Meet video games. In what may be an industry first, Kitty Rides USA has introduced the Video Car, a coin operated kitty ride in the shape of a Ferrari Formula One car that moves based on the motion of the steering wheel, but with the added benefit that a video game sh is shown on a monitor at the front of the car and is also being controlled by that same steering wheel. Great for the younger set that may not be able to understand video games, but would still get a kitty ride for their money anyway. Absolutely. Um, kitty Rides USA was one of the big, big, I, I don't know if they're still around just because kitty rides aren't my area of expertise, but I do know they were one of the big, big, big top kitty ride companies in the United States. Well, and according to their website, um, they are the last mm -hmm. American manufacturer of kitty rides. And I actually contacted them asking questions about this because, uh, and I haven't gotten an answer back, unfortunately yet, but, uh, and I may not, but I did ask them if they had any more information about this. And if they had anybody around who has been at the company for a while, who'd be willing to be interviewed because yeah. this would be a fascinating side line. Cause as a, as the proud parent of a three-year-old kitty rides still exist and 
they oh, love yeah. a lot of them include video game like features nowadays. Uh, my kid just wrote a this kitty ride helicopter thing that went up and down, and on the screen there were these balloons flying at you, and you had to fly into the mm-hmm. balloons. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, it truly ahead of its time, uh, because, I mean, it, it definitely didn't stick at that time. I, I know when when I was on kiddie rides in kind of the mid-80s, uh, they were they were just very traditional. I don't remember any video screens. But, but yeah, I, I think there's a, a scramble throughout the, the industry. Obviously, Kiddie Rides USA is already targeting young kids, but there, there's a scramble to figure out where the money is going to keep coming from in coin-op, because this is a period when when coin op has gone into decline and it's interesting uh you know it's gone into decline because the video part of it is collapsing but it's interesting that this is also the moment that kitty rides usa decides that they need to capture some of that video mojo to kind of buck up their their more traditional uh <laughs> coin op business well it's also i mean we see it now with the price war on the computer side this tech is becoming mm. cheap enough where they can just buy something off the mm. shelf program it themselves throw it in there without having to have the engineering staff on there to develop their own silicone and everything else which up until recently up until a a year or so before this was really the only option for this kind of uh amusement i mean we saw it just now with turn an apple two you know buy a bunch of old Mm -hmm. apple twos and turn them into an arcade cabinet a whole hell of a lot cheaper than buying you know a three thousand dollar machine from atari and absolutely and, and to the point we're seeing also a lot of companies trying to make arcade cabinets in kitty size. There's at least two manufacturers that I found that were making, you know, games for little kids in miniature cabinets, uh, similar to what you might call, you know, a one third yep. size cabinet nowadays. And also Sega was releasing a lot of their normally released arcade games but in a smaller cabinet in the shape of animals according to a report i have not been able to find any pictures of these but right but but yeah i mean capturing that that kids market was becoming a, a big thing i mean everyone was imitating uh chuck e cheese not just showbiz but uh even coin op companies like uh bally midway and sega were opening their own uh or i should say bally uh ethan doesn't like it when people say bally midway you gotta <laughs> gotta always look over your shoulder at the at the uh at the whip there in the corner but uh you know even uh bally and and sega were opening those kind of places and especially with the traditional uh video game market and coin op video game market in decline in this period uh capturing new markets uh was especially important oh yeah with the downturn well in the saturation i mean we've talked on the show just in the last couple of months how many new Chuck E. Cheese locations are opening, how many more showbiz pizza uh, ones are opening. And it's it's just insane. I mean, there's no way that that's mm-hmm. sustainable. But, hey, we're coming out of uh, – uh, or we're still in a recession uh, at this point. So there's a lot of people willing to, you know, take a chance on anything that will make a buck. Absolutely. Oh, well. Ah, uh, now – Speaking of things that won't make a buck, <laughs> Atari announces my first computer. We talked about other companies showing off keyboard add-ons for the Atari VCS last month, but now Atari has thrown their hat in the ring as well. The My First Computer, an 8K chiclet keyboard that sits atop the 2600, will be targeting a sub-$90 price point. They already acknowledge, though, that the single peripheral port needs to be addressed before shipping as having to choose between a disk drive and a printer would make applications like word processing all but impossible. Yeah, I mean, this just goes to show how crazy the home computer mania was getting in this time period. And in part... I think Atari was, I mean, I haven't spoke to anyone at Atari about this specifically, but uh, a part of it, I think, is just they had to protect their own flank because there were other companies that were starting to release add-ons and enhancements as you as you previously covered. And so I think Atari felt like they had to kind of cover their flank there. And it's just, yeah, everything needs to be a computer anymore. Everyone is starting to talk about how 
you know, video games are dead, long live computers, and it's it's a survival tactic uh, in a way, but not a not a very well thought out one, I don't well, think. I mean, as all survival tactics are, it's it's being driven simply by we we need to cover the flank, and I mean, this project is going to get renamed the Graduate has a bunch of mm-hmm. peripherals, including a modem announced for it. It never hits its September 83 launch date as the market collapses around it. The economics of the system mm-hmm. never make any sense. They can never get it down to the $90 price point. And even at $90, there's other machines that cost 20 bucks more that can do tremendously more. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, yeah, the the bitter home computer price wars are just basically going to make this not make any sense. And absolutely yeah, it's if they had probably tried launching this two years earlier, this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, they, they had done their, their keyboard controller, <laughs> <laughs> the, the keypads, you know, back in, in the late seventies. And that was the period of time when everyone was high on this idea of video games as training platforms for budding computer users, because at that time, the economics made more sense because computers were so expensive. So yeah, just just a product that's really out of step with the economic realities. But you can kind of understand why they thought they had to do it at the same oh, time. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, yeah, the competition is coming hot from all sides in this area. And, you know, in hindsight, we obviously like, well, that was a dumb idea. But at the time, you can totally see why somebody – especially given how long you need to prep one of these products before you even even start mm-hmm. showing it. Although we'll see people who obviously didn't prep very long before showing a product. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Uh, it, you can see that, you know, they're like, well, if this does catch on, we don't want to be left behind. But there's so many things. I mean, they've already got two computers out there and we'll talk about a third one in a moment. It, yeah, it's just too much. Too many incompatible yeah. platforms. Oh, well. <sighs> anyway, mm. speaking of incompatible platforms, Mattel shows off in Television 3 behind closed doors. While Mattel was touting the revamped, cost-reduced in television, the Intellivision 2, its entertainment computer system, a.k.a. keyboard add-on, and Aquarius computer on the CES show floor, Behind closed doors, the Intellivision 3, its next generation system, was being shown off. More RAM, higher resolution, wireless controllers, multicolored sprites, integrated voice synthesizer, 64 objects on the screen at the same time. Well, it looks amazing, and with a third quarter launch planned, it will definitely be a contender, despite no software being more than 20% complete at the show. (laughs) <laughs> yeah Mattel was working on a couple of things because they also had a four that they were working on and three was kind of their incremental step up to kind of keep pace with uh, the Coleca visions of and uh, 5200s of the world while they while they worked on their their real next gen system the Intellivision 4 and yeah they're just uh didn't quite happen the, the way that headline uh, implies. Well, the funny <laughs> thing is, over on BlueSkyRangers.com, they have a great article about this. Apparently, what mm-hmm. they were showing, the demo that they were showing, wasn't even the Intellivision 3 hardware. It was just, yeah. you know, really, really well done, slightly animated still image demos, non-playable, running on standard Intellivision hardware. And they yep. were trying to do so many new things with this redesign, the very, already very complicated custom chips in here and stuff. It just it – was, it was going crazy, yeah. especially because it was supposed to be backwards compatible. Exactly. So, yeah, that, that obviously never ends up happening. Uh, yeah. There is an Intellivision 3, but it's not that one. It's just a cosmetic upgrade to the Intellivision 2 at, at the, uh, the new INTV Corp later on down the line yeah. and uh yeah not not much more to say about no, that no another company that's failing or flailing to stay uh, relevant with but hey the aquarius is out there so 
<laughs> That's right. And speaking of the Zodiac, Coleco announces Gemini. Nice transition. While Atari has already filed suit against Coleco for their Module 1, that's the uh, thing that makes it play 2600 games, they are going to be royally ticked off by Coleco's showing of the Gemini video game system, a 2600 compatible console that will retail for under $100 and feature joysticks that integrate both the stick and paddles for the 2600 into one item. An add-on module was also shown called the Voice Module that will use cassettes to add recorded sounds to compatible games. I just I just don't know. I guess I would have had to be there, but I don't know why speech synthesis was so exciting to everybody. Everything had to have a speech add-on. Mattel had one. Magnavox had one. It was It was the wave of the future. I can tell you from experience, this is... 1980 this would have been 1981 i was five years old um uh, my neighbor kid it was uh nikki no mickey something i can't remember what his last name was we were blown away it was the most amazing thing ever his dad had a car that told you to buckle your seatbelt <laughs> before you left with a voice that said, please buckle your seatbelt. This was like the future had arrived. We would sit in the car and we would just basically turn the key so it would say, <laughs> please buckle your seatbelt over and over and over again. Also, don't forget, Night Rider is going to come out. The oh, yes. idea of a computer that can talk to you. We saw it on Star Trek, you know. The Star Trek reruns were still running. Yeah. Uh, 2001. Yeah, but if you if you look <laughs> back, I've, if memory serves me right, the old Batman TV show, the computer never talks. Computer has a printout, has a readout. That was considered realistic. But mm -hmm. the Star Trek computer talked to you. This was simply, you know, that next level. It wasn't just the bloops and the bleeps. It could talk. Right. So yeah, I understand from personal experience the excitement of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's fair. So, yeah, it's it's one of those things where, you know, in hindsight, you're like, mm, it's, it's like a rendered intro or a FMV intro to a to a PlayStation 1 game, you know. And nowadays you yep. look at it going, why the <laughs> frag would you want to waste so much space and money on this thing that you're going to watch once? But damn, we thought it was a cool thing back in the day. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. So yeah, Jim and I, uh, of course, Atari not happy about that uh, because they're they're already losing control of their software market, and now there's a threat to their hardware market uh, as well with the. Uh, as far as I know, clean room reverse engineered VCS club. Yeah, Coleco just seems to be a company that's on top of this, and I don't think they would have screwed uh, with doing anything that was, wasn't was above board, especially because they didn't really have to. Now, uh, interesting, yep. this whole idea of 2600 compatibility is getting way, way out of hand at this point since everybody seems to be doing it. There's a company called Cardco that has announced the Cardaptor, which is a terrible name, which is an add-on for the VIC-20 that lets you play 2,600 cards. Obviously, this never happens. There's really no way to make this work other than the adapter just gets power from the VIC-20 because you'll never be able to output it. And it's only going to cost you eighty nine ninety five, which makes absolutely no sense if the Gemini will cost you less. So, uh, exactly. But, you know, it's just the idea that everybody's crazy for you can play the most popular system on this just as that most popular that's system right. is so outdated that nobody's really want to play it anymore but that's another issue entirely yep and you know of course this followed on you know from coleco's uh you know adapter for the coleco division the, the module one that, that played atari vcs games because you know carl add-ons are the new name 
of the game. That's right. Oh, you are you're finally getting into the groove of this. The transition is important. Thank you. Uh, console makers are going for expansions to their machines to keep players happy. From Atari showing off a trackball for the 2600 to Milton Bradley previewing both a light pen and a touchscreen add-on for the Vectrex. Coleco showing off expansion module 3, a super game module that will allow next generation level games like a port of Donkey Kong featuring all the levels. Imagine that. Uh, via <laughs> wafer cards that can store up to one megabit of data. Yes. Uh, Everybody's got more crap to plug onto your system. It's the Sega power, Tower of Power before the Sega Tower <laughs> of Power. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 coming to be a real question on on how do you extend the life of some of these systems and stand out in this crowded field. I mean, that's certainly what Atari is feeling with its VCS, and of course, Coleco had the expandability thing from from the very beginning, uh, from the mm. launch of the system, and. You know, I think it's just another way to make your product feel feel like more. Um, well, also, I don't have any deep insights into into the add on mania here. But well, and and here you did you did a great episode on your show about the crash that almost was the the transition yes. from the eight to sixteen bit generation, where and nobody yep. really knew are the customers actually going to fork over the cash required to buy a new system and simply be like, okay, my mm -hmm. old NES is now going to cut uh, and games are going to collect dust because now I have to plug in the new system. Do we have any insight as to whether or not the makers of the systems at this time were worried that people wouldn't be willing to buy a new system? I'm, I'm sure that's uh part of it i mean you know the technology is is changing so rapidly and because you know moore's law is always at work and i think it's it's a matter of of trying to keep people engaged because there is there is a worry uh, i think that that the games have reached a certain limit the systems have reached a certain limit of what they can portray the games have reached a certain limit everything is a berserk clone or a donkey kong clone or a pac-man clone or <laughs> you know of, of just a few types of games and yeah I, i'm sure some of the same forces are at play that were in play in the mid 90s about you know will we be able to get people to keep buying new systems and and add-ons are are certainly another way to to keep getting the hardware more and more up to date yeah uh, yeah, it just feels like the trying to keep stuff on life support. And obviously all this stuff was in development way before Atari announced mm -hmm. its bad news in December. So a lot of these projects are probably standing there at CES going, oh, the chances of this going on. Like Coleco's Module 3 will never ship this upgraded right. version. Um, the Module 3 that does ship... Uh, is going to be a very different beast. It's going to be the thing that turns into the Atom computer, which in and of itself mm -hmm. is a disaster. <laughs> uh, Stay yeah, tuned. That, that's coming. Don't worry, people. That's coming. <laughs> uh, and we also have another interesting little side one that I saw uh, right up on Unitoys. is a company that they're going to bring out the Expander. It's another one. Turn your 2600 into a computer via cassette based uh, uh storage and 16k of mm -hmm. ram which yeah but uh yeah it's 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 also not going anywhere absolutely but uh i think i think you forgot one there carl because also this month amiga's joy board brings motion controls to the vcs uh, I, I i had to keep this separate because uh, amiga what can i say Soft spot. <laughs> Amiga Incorporated has introduced the Joyboard, a motion controller that will allow players to control games with their feet. The included game Mogul Maniac is a first person skiing simulator. Yeah. You know, it's easy, it's easy to forget because, of course, you know, the Commodore Amiga became a thing, but Amiga Corporation started as a video game company. Their whole idea was to do video games, and what became the Amiga computer was going to be a video game console, codenamed Lorraine, and to keep the lights on while they got Lorraine ready to go, they started selling video games. And since they had all sorts of hardware engineers, they decided that in addition to releasing some games, they could also do some 
some fun peripheral stuff uh, as well, like the joy board. Exactly. And the joy board is especially interesting because if you were an Amiga user back in the day, there's a thing called uh, the Guru Meditation Error, which is basically our blue screen of death. And uh, this actually comes from the joy board because uh, they would have these little contests inside the company who could balance on this thing the longest. And this was called guru meditation. So, you know, you're, you're meditating while trying to keep the balance on the thing. And that became the name for the error code uh, when the machine crashed. So uh, fun stuff like that. Now, uh, Amiga has also announced a bunch of games. One of them is Ghost Attack, a 3D game that will require red and blue lens glasses. The game's never going to appear. They've got a ton of stuff in the pipeline. Obviously, they've got people who worked on the 2600, so they should know what's going on. You know, Jay Miner's there. But yeah, so Amiga is out there. We talked about how uh, one of the founding members of Amiga left Activision uh, last year. But, uh, and so, and he was already then talking about he was going to make the super system. So it was obviously going to be a hardware company. They were talking about that from the very get go. But yeah, you're right. They're trying to keep the lights on. They're also going to release some joysticks and so forth. But, uh, yep. yeah, the, the crash of the market is going to make this business plan of make stuff for the 2600 to finance a new system a little bit complicated. A little shaky there. Just a little shaky just there. Little. <laughs> <laughs> but uh in the meantime let's uh let's think of the children again because uh now atari goes after preschoolers that sounds so creepy if you say it the wrong way it it, yeah. it can in an attempt do you like video games <laughs> video come games to my basement pizza. i got a whole cabinet full of video games <laughs> <laughs> oh wow you you really do sound like the creepy old neighbor from family guy okay yeah i didn't have the you know i didn't have the the whistle in there but, you know <laughs> oh. in an attempt to expand the audience for vcs titles atari has gotten the licenses to sesame street and peanuts for use in a series of children's games for the vcs a new controller a pad with large directional buttons and a fire button will help the kiddies get the hang of the games yep this this was part of a general trend uh, atari was going after licenses left and right at this period of time they were also getting things like garfield gremlins duke of has dukes of hazard some children's stuff some not uh i actually interviewed ron St stringari uh, who recently passed away but he was the marketing guy that made most of these deals and yeah they were just they were trying to open up the market in every direction they possibly could and uh certainly video games i think were home video games were kind of considered kind of uh 6 to 12 6 to 13 kind of market uh and so you know going there was a an uncaptured market there to to try to go a little younger yeah definitely i mean uh obviously you're going to have to refigure some of the controls and everything else keep it simpler which as you just saw with Spider-Man, you know, collision detection on a 2600 isn't always <laughs> all that precise. Uh, so, yeah, this, this is going to be a fun uh, challenge. Now, the kids controller, as they're calling it, was actually a 12-button telephone-style controller. Uh, and you just had overlays. So, theoretically, for different games, you could have different controls. Uh, but, yeah, so it's it's interesting that they're trying this. Now, they're not alone. Mattel is also mm -hmm. doing this. They've got a lineup of games for targeting younger uh, set, including Scooby-Doo Mo Maze Chase, Moose Chase, I almost said, uh, <laughs> Maze Chase, Master the Masters of the Universe, which obviously they own, Rocky and Bullwinkle, mm -hmm. and of course, Kool-Aid, because the Kool-Aid game is something we all remember from back in the day. Or, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing like a giant <laughs> anthropomorphic thing full of... <laughs> red liquid and wants you to drink it popping through a wall. <laughs> Sorry. The, the idea that it wanted you to drink Kool-Aid and it was Kool-Aid was kind of like, you know, having a butcher shop uh, 
It's mass. Well, it's just like the restaurant at the, the restaurant at the end. The restaurant at the end of the universe. Oh yeah, yeah, you know? that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Millie ways with the cow. <laughs> uh, so so disturbing. So disturbing. You know, I I read the book that was disturbing, and then years later I saw the TV show, and that actually mm. made it worse. That yes. made it so yes. much worse. <laughs> so. You, you'll you'll appreciate this. This has nothing to do with video games, but we'll we'll bring a little bit of our they create worlds tangent into things. So as as I believe you know, I I lived in Germany for a bit, and uh, I believe it's still there in in the city of Kaiserslautern, uh, which is uh, where we lived. There is a bar called Millieways, and the logo of the bar is this cow's head with uh with a gun to his head. And, you know, it has the the font and everything. So it is, I, I never went in, just looking in, it's just a standard bar. Like it's not themed mm. inside, but it is, it is named there in, there in Kaiserslautern. If you're ever in that neck of the woods, uh, if you're ever in their I, I desperately <laughs> hope that it's still there because it deserves to be there. <laughs> so fun. Oh, well. Uh, now, uh. Now, all of those were 2,600 titles, presumably also in television. But, you know, at this point, I think uh, Mattel is just, you know, wherever we can make some money. Uh, Scooby-Doo and Rocky and Bullwinkle won't make it into production for the 2,600. And in the case of Scooby, uh, and not at all for Rocky. So Scooby will get in television release. It's not worth playing. It's a terrible game. Uh, I try. I booted it up just to test it. Don't. But yeah. Thank you for your service. What can I say? I, I put myself through <laughs> terrible things for this show sometimes. Uh, now, the Masters of the Universe game, I've also tried playing over the years. Uh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. It's it's terrible, terrible game. Now, granted, Masters of the Universe never got really good games, uh, and I've Pretty much, yeah, I've played them all, actually. No, I haven't played the PS2 yeah. game. That that I, I still haven't done Fair. to myself. But uh, everything else was pretty god-awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now uh, let's continue this little licensing trend we have going on here, because a new challenger has appeared. Sega enters... The cartridge market. While Sega has licensed games before for home systems, it has now announced, through its Sega Consumer Products division, its entry into the Atari 2600 space with an initial lineup of three titles, Taxan and Subterfuge, and Paramount film properties such as... Wait, did I say three titles? I said three titles and there's only two. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's late. Good, good job, yeah. team. And Paramount film <laughs> properties such as Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, Airplane, War of the Worlds, Friday the 13th, Dragon Slayer, not to be confused with another game that's coming out soon, Marathon mm -hmm. Man, and Mission Impossible. Oh, and uh, three Book Rogers titles apparently inspired, inspired by the old serials. Why? What, what would the Marathon Man... <laughs> game even look like i mean are you just being like tortured by lord olivier for three hours yeah, anyway actually there's I... one of the magazines that actually makes that a joke very similar to that yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's it's like uh, there's no reason airplane what would you do in airplane the movie uh, uh, the game i mean it's war of the worlds i can yeah. maybe imagine uh wrath of khan would be but there's yeah, and of course Star Trek Three. I mean, essentially, you know, the the Star Trek game in the arcades. I think essentially started as a Star Trek Three game. I can't remember. Yeah, Ethan will say something if I'm wrong. <laughs> well, no. Well, Star Trek Three. I mean, Star Trek Three might mm -hmm. have been in production. I think it comes out in '84. I mean, Search for Spock is not out yet, not by a long shot. Right. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, you know, th there are a couple of things going on here that, that are worth examining, though, because um, a lot of this is it's yes, all of these companies are going after licenses uh, because it's a crowded market and they're starting to think that this is what they're going to need to stand out. It's like, oh, well, we can't do, you know, we can't do space jockey. 
that didn't work. Uh, you know, yeah. so we need to have Buck Rogers presents Space Jockey, you know. I mean, not that that's a Sega game, but I'm just saying, you know, clearly original games that are just the upteenth ripoff of Space Invaders, Defender, Berserk, Pac-Man aren't selling. And so the, the hope is to tie a license in. But on the other side, there's also something interesting going on because licensing had only very recently become a thing that you did with movies and TV shows. Because even though there had been attempts in the past, uh, before the Kenner Star Wars figures, licensing just almost never worked. Even those few franchises that exist, like James Bond was a film franchise and there was an attempt uh, I don't know if it was in the 60s or 70s, because I'm not a toy historian, but there was an attempt, probably the 60s, to do a line. And, you know, that kind of flopped. Movies didn't work. Television shows, you got a little success here and there. There were some Star Wars action. Or, Star Trek. There were some Star Trek action figures. Um, But this was something new. And uh, these companies were realizing that they could merchandise, plus this... Um, video cassette market was also starting up. So for a company like Sega specifically, uh, which we have to remember is owned by Gulf and Western, which is also the owner of Paramount Pictures, this represents something interesting as well. And Paramount a home video was actually getting very involved with Sega's business at this time. Uh, because uh, they were established in June 1982 to do the home video thing, but they realized that they, once they had the distribution, that they could also be distributors of video games. And so uh, Sega Consumer Products uh, was opened as a separate part of Sega, separate from their Sega Electronics Arcade operation and other stuff going on, uh, to do these home games that then Paramount Home Video would be the distributors for through the network that they had built up for the video cassette business. So there's there's a lot of things happening here with with technology and how it's starting to interact with mass media. Oh, definitely. And I think there was I get this feeling that there's another aspect to it namely uh there's a rejection like you said of things like, you know, the upteenth defender clone and games that seem to be very popular, like Pitfall, for example, are conveying some semblance of a story at this point. And you mm. also get, you know, Raiders and E.T. are both attempts to capture the idea of adventure where you're telling an actual continuous story throughout the game, which given the extremely limited technology is extremely difficult to pull off, but probably is a lot easier to pull off. If you have an existing movie that has a plot where you don't have to explain it on the screen, mm -hmm. the, the example I always think of, which I think was a really good adaptation of the source material, this is going to seem totally bizarre, is the Porky's game for the 2600. Hmm. Because it's representing certain key scenes from the movie. You know, the, you know, look through the whole, see the girls, or, or I think there's, some semblance of that scene and then move up and get into the, into the Porky's um, uh, casino. It's, it's dumb. It's nonsensical, but if mm -hmm. you've seen the movie, the video game actions that occur make sense. If you haven't seen the movie, right. it's nonsense. But by having that storyline given it, it works. Uh, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, if you had to actually tell a complex story like that, I mean, Pitfall works because you've seen Indiana Jones. If you haven't right. seen, in, if you haven't seen Raiders, and it's only Raiders at this point, if you haven't seen Raiders, I don't know if Pitfall would make any sense. You know, why are you running through a jungle? Why right. are there treasures here? That, that mm -hmm. isn't an automatic thing, but because you've, everybody has seen Raiders, it makes sense. Absolutely. No, that's that's very true. And I, you can almost see how that might work 
with the right game and the right context. And, you know, it, it certainly worked for you uh, in in the context of Porky's. But, you know, it's 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 so much harder to see, you know, with with something that the narrative is the main part of the experience where even if you could pull an action element out of it, because you can make an action element out of almost everything. It's, it's like, why would people be interested in that? Exactly. Like if, if your entire premise is based on being a darkly humorous, satirical look at the Vietnam war through the lens of the Korean war, how would that ever really work as a video game, even if you could have some kind of the doctors are trying to save someone's life scene as your action element? But despite all that, Fox announces MASH game. Thank you for that beautiful transition, just now. April will see the launch of a game based on the hit TV show MASH. Players will control the mobile hospital staff, collecting injured people brought in by helicopter, and then operate on them in a weird maze chase kind of game. No doubt it'll be a hit with the show's ratings holding high. Oh, uh, wait, uh, it says here, the last episode is airing on February 28th. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, we're, we're ending the show and then we're going to put a game out about it months later. That's, that's a great idea. Uh, yeah. Though, you know, to be fair, it is, it is hard to overstate the popularity and omnipresence of MASH at that time. And it is still to this day and unless television changes dramatically it will always be so it is still the the series finale of mash is the highest rated non-sporting event most watched non-sporting event in u.s television history yeah and i still remember as a little kid i mean we wa we used to watch it at home uh and i remember a news report from that day on the local news where they were showing people dressed up as the characters at giant watch parties for the final episode. I still remember that. Yeah. And a tremendous number of people dressed as Klinger for some reason. And, <laughs> and it wasn't Klinger from the last couple seasons when he stopped doing the drag thing. It was still Klinger in right. full drag. Uh, then again, it was the 80s. You didn't have a lot of opportunities to be able to do that out in public without, you know, serious backlash, unfortunately. So no, there's 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 still a dedicated fandom. I was just at the Atlanta Comic Con uh, last this this past weekend that just ended, and uh, Loretta Swit and Jamie Farr uh, were there, Hulahan and oh, cool. and Clear, <laughs> at the at the convention. So oh yeah, no, I mean it it, it was a great show. It's still tremendously watchable. Uh, I, I'm split on whether or not I like the movie or the TV show more, but that's just me. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean it was it it's. It's just one of those classics. It's like WKRP. I mean, it's it's an evergreen, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. And in in fairness, I mean, I agree with you. The timing is kind of ridiculous. But in in fairness, it of course became a syndication stalwart, and there are uh, there are generations that that grew up on on Mash, literally grew up on Mash, that weren't even born when the Mash uh, finale. That's hit. true. That is very true. Um, and a lot of those people keep wondering why the cast is different from episode to episode. <laughs> uh. Exactly. So, but, but it's, it's, it's again, it's like, sure, you could probably, and, and I don't know what the gameplay was, was, was like, oh, uh, it's, but I mean, it's you terrible. Do, it's terrible. It's yeah. I mean, you can theoretically do a hospital unit, mobile hospital, life or death, saving people kind of, element out of that but it completely misses the point <laughs> of the property to do that yeah yeah <laughs> it it does uh and i think it was just you know well what happens in this that would even turn into that i mean the best way to have done it would have been maybe an rpg or or an adventure game yeah. might have worked you know with some little action elements occasionally but 
that's just not going to happen on a 2600 or in television. I mean, I think there's even a TI-99 version of the game. It's, yeah. Yeah, Fox had Fox had a deal to release things on the on the TI ninety nine. Absolutely, but uh, you know, at least with all of these ridiculous licensed games coming out from all of these publishers, that consumers were not entirely in the dark anymore because they could, in fact, start trying before they buy. Because video game rentals are taking off. Very nice. With the myriad of titles coming out for consoles every month, it is no surprise that the first video game rental services have begun popping up. An article in Electronic Fun with Computer Games, great title for a magazine, highlights the advantages of renting a game, low risk by renting for as little as $2 a day, being able to experience a much wider variety of titles, and in some cases allotting the amount paid for rental fees towards the purchase of the game in question. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that makes sense was going to happen once... Once there were enough games on the market where it it became hard to to make sense of it all, because video games have always been an expensive investment. Yeah. And, you know, it it, it sucks to, to put down your at, at this period of time, 20, 30, 35 dollars on on a title only to discover that it's terrible. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's the same thing that drove Blockbuster and all the others to to really uh turn up the whole video game rental thing in the uh, the NES and uh, Genesis era. Exactly. And the other thing with this is also it's going to expose people to just how little content is in most of these games. I mean, how repetitive the levels are. I mean, when you're stuck with the game because you bought it, fine. But, you know, like the Spider-Man game you played today – once you've played through the first level, you've pretty much seen mm-hmm. everything the game has to offer. You just get variations on the above. Exactly. And and yeah, which is which is part of the reason why, you know, that definitely was not something that uh the video game uh creators <laughs> looked very fondly on i mean they didn't in the nintendo era either but especially when yeah i mean you rent a game for three days and if you're good at games you can you can be done with a lot of games from this time period forever exactly so of course though so of course very soon you'll be able to buy games for as little as two dollars <laughs> <laughs> which kind of throws this entire uh business model off <laughs> this is true but in its defense, uh, when I was a kid growing up in Buenos Aires in the late 80s, very mm-hmm. early 90s, I still remember that the same stores where I would buy illegal copies of computer software would also mm-hmm. rent Atari 2600 cartridges because there was a company in Argentina that was building licensed versions of the 2600 and mm-hmm. a lot of kids would just, you know, you know, for a buck or two rent. That was the first time I ever saw an E.T. cartridge. That I had no perception that E.T. existed as a game. <laughs> but I do remember seeing the E.T. cartridge going, how do you make a game out of E.T.? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question that could fill volumes. your volumes, <laughs> Scarl. And has. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> oh well but for now it's, it's time to uh, begin our process of leaving this crazy world of console games uh and by way of transition talk about how toy retailers plan shift from consoles to computers in the aftermath of the holiday season many toy retailers seem to believe that the new boom market is home computers This shift makes sense given that they have seen the handheld electronics market move from a top mover to a second fiddle to consoles. The relative sophistication of the home computer feels like the next step, and announcements by a growing number of console software providers that they will be entering the home computer market helps add credibility to this theory. Yeah, and you know, there was a real merging of the cartridge market in this time period, because at the same time you had more and more console makers announcing that they were going to make games for the home computers, you had more and more computer game companies announcing that they were going to make cartridges 
for the VIC-20, for the Atari 8-bit systems, uh, occasionally for the TI-99, and even very occasionally, you know, dipping their toes into the VCS or ColecoVision markets. Yeah. Well, and when I talked to Ken Williams, uh, that was one of the things that almost wiped out Sierra, was Mm -hmm. that they went deep into that console market, uh, into that cartridge-based software market. And when you consider that the VIC-20 had sold a million units at this point, uh, Mm -hmm. and had so little memory that releasing on any other medium didn't make sense for games you can see where this problem comes in and texas instruments also you know didn't really promote anything other than rom based uh uh mm-hmm. media for their system and that and that system's also going for pennies on the dollar so it it kind of makes sense the commodore 64 also has the cartridge slot in it so when that starts selling well but Right, because I mean, because that was one of the things that that set you know the home computer apart. Is this? It's not just this idea that it's cheaper; it's also this idea that it's easier to use right out of the box. It's not like an Apple II where you have that intimidating green blinking parser and nothing else <laughs> when you boot the sucker up. Uh, and so, and and the cartridges were a big part of that because yeah, all these games, you know, you could could go in or all these games all these computers you could put discs in you could go to the command line you could do this and that but if you put a cartridge in it overrode all of that nonsense and it just loaded which for uh a society that was not very computer literate yet was kind of a big deal Oh yeah tremendously i mean it yeah it it really made that home computer useful and you can see it also in the advertising the famous uh Bill Shatner ad where he, you know mm-hmm. there's the Plimpton stand-in and the Atari Kid stand-in and mm-hmm. he comes in and is like it does your accounting it does this and it plays great games and he sh- and you basically you see the cartridge go in uh, so yep. yeah it makes perfect sense that if you're a retailer you're thinking okay uh, we're done with that this is the way to go and it's especially since their margins are getting more and more destroyed because you know Atari, and this was this was definitely a mistake. You know, Atari resisted ever doing official price cuts on the VCS. I mean, once the whole market was falling apart, they started cutting the price like crazy. But for most of its existence, it remained at the uh, MSRP of one ninety. Now, by nineteen eighty one, even no one out in the real world was buying a VCS. 190 anymore uh you know it was between 120 and 140 or 150 most places but the retailers were taking that hit because atari was not instituting a formal price cut so the retailers knowing that their real sales were in software were taking a a smaller cut essentially to be a a loss leader for the, the software so you know, their margins were already getting squeezed on the hardware. And now that there's a glut in the market and the crash is starting, they're starting to get squeezed anymore. And so it makes sense for the Toys R Us's and Kmart's of the world to kind of latch on to the home computer as something that can reverse this this trend in, in their hardware business being kind of untenable. Yeah. And unfortunately, they, they haven't figured out yet that one thing you can do with computer software you can copy it because it's a computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's uh, that's a thing that I've heard, just heard yeah, just yeah, rumors that, that that people did. Yeah, yeah, no, no personal experience there. No matter what I've and, already said in this episode. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and and of course, I mean, computers were just in the zeitgeist at the time. I mean, even time crowns the computer man of the year. <laughs> Time Magazine has chosen the personal computer as the man of the year. According to the magazine's editor, many candidates existed, but none had the wide-ranging impact of the personal computer. Alone in 1982, 2.8 million machines were sold in the United States. Yep. Now, I'm, I'm sure you know the story, which I have not looked into in detail, but, you know... the. The word is, and I am not presenting this as true, that Steve Jobs was supposed to be man of the year 
And then because he was kind of controversial, they dropped him. This may not be true. Wow. That, I haven't um, heard that story. No. Well, you know, Steve was being profiled by Time. And, you know, there had been a like an opinion poll, you know, because they release opinion. You know, they get they do opinion polls before they do Man of the Year where they ask the public and whatnot who should be Man of the Year. And Steve Jobs was very high on the list. And Time sent a reporter to profile him. And Steve Jobs was convinced that it's because they were going to make him Man of the Year. I don't think they actually told him that. I think he was just <laughs> convinced of it. And so this may just be Steve Jobs' ego. There may be no truth to the story. But th this is actually a plot point in in the Aaron Sorkin Jobs movie where he's like, I was supposed to be Man of the Year. And then uh, Hoffman, the Kate Winslet character, is like, no, you weren't. Don't be stupid. <laughs> so, you know, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily true, but it is interesting that they they went with a machine over over an individual in in 1982 whatever the reason now it wasn't without precedent at this point um right. they had done this for groups of people before they'd never done it for a machine but or and it's not just the personal computer the the IBM PC right. they're talking all personal yes. computers so it's a category uh now would it surprise me that Steve Jobs thought it, they were profiling him to become man of the year? Right. No, that does not surprise me because Steve Jobs was basically ego incarnate, um, which, yeah, we we don't need to go there. My, my opinion of the man was not great. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, that anecdote, I don't know if it's true. But I want it to be true so much. <laughs> right. Just to imagine his little face when he picked up the magazine and it wasn't his face on the magazine. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I'm like I said, I'm not warranting it is true, but that's one of those those big stories that that's out there. But yeah, I mean, you know, the computer just you know, suddenly hit the mainstream. It was a couple things. I mean, I say suddenly, you know, but it was, you know, a five year journey or whatever. I mean, you had the the first real cheap home computers coming out. And so that was getting all the press. And then you had IBM entering the market, which was kind of the, uh, the validation of computers in the home. Well, if IBM is doing it, then it must be real. Well, also I remember the, the Charlie Chaplin ads running in prime mm -hmm. time. I remember mm -hmm. those vividly as a kid and, you know, suddenly this seemed like something that was normalized. You know, it it wasn't it wasn't any longer something that was just on Star Trek or in Bat on Batman. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my family didn't pick up a C sixty four until well, it was probably very very early eighty five. So it was post Christmas eighty four, early eighty five, but also before Easter. So it was somewhere in that window. Yeah. Uh, and but still, it's just insane that you know how big this suddenly got, and the influence of it, and the quantity of players. It makes it look like this is the new gold rush. This is where we're going. Mm -hmm. And and there was a real, you know, continuum at the time where where video games were in some ways considered computers. So it's like. You know, we had them in the arcades, then we had them in the home. Now we're getting sophisticated computers in the home. Now IBM's entering the business market. It's it's just a period of time where people are starting to get a sense that, okay, maybe this technology really is about to start changing lives. You know, maybe we never are going to store our recipes on it or, you know, whatever other stuff they were peddling at them at the time. But maybe, maybe it really is almost here. Well, yeah. And, uh... Well, I yeah. mean, if you look at and the fiction of the time, like I said, Knight mm -hmm. Rider with Kit, Airwolf yep, yep. is going to be coming out, Blue Thunder comes <laughs> out, uh, we've already had mm -hmm. Tron in the movies, we're going to get war games here in, 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 uh, in short order, we're going to talk about another movie featuring video games uh, in a little bit, but it just, computers seem to be everywhere controlling everything, It's it's insane. 
Exactly. I mean, CES and Toy Fair see new computers galore. Of course. We covered some of the new showings last month, but a brief overview of new systems can't hurt. So, we're going to – this is just a laundry list of them. We can talk about them uh, briefly in between, but UltraVision showed off their home entertainment center – an all-in-one TV console computer hybrid that could allegedly play Apple, Commodore, and Atari 800 software and, through modules, play 2600 and ColecoVision carts. The modules would cost $99 on top of the system's base price of $999. It's a lot of Mr. Cores there. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, that that actually would be a cool build. Design it now. If you have never seen a picture of this, I'll I'll put one in. Uh, there's a, a picture of it in the links in the show notes. But yeah, this thing just looks like a portable CRT TV screen with like a dozen extra knobs on the side. So it's it's a bit of a mess. Um. And, uh, yeah, all I can say about it is, uh, yeah, uh, it obviously went nowhere because at a thousand dollars, what the, what the hell, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. And of, there's no way it could do all this. I mean, where, no, no, no. Where, where are they getting the chips from? It, no, no, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but then again, we, we've seen this in the 30 year jumps with, uh, certain, Certain makers of console software and hardware trying to make systems that will run everything. So, and mm -hmm. somebody who also makes the Action 52. But, okay, uh, enough about that. <laughs> These are people who don't know what they're doing. Let's talk about people who do know what they're doing. Spectra Video showed off the Spectra Video SV318 at $299, featuring 32K of RAM, expandability, and a built-in joystick on the keyboard. The Z80 machine features the Texas Instruments TMS9918A graphic chip, also found in the ColecoVision SG-1000 and MSX machines. And we, we have we have to take a moment to stop on this one, because this is actually right here. What you're looking at is the beginning of the MSX standard. I was about to say, because that built-in keyboard on the side, the MSXs all have on the same spot. They just have four buttons, um, directional buttons, but it's basically the same idea. So, Spectre Video, we, we, we have to stop on this one. This one would have probably actually been been worth its own own headline because of, of its importance, even though the computer itself doesn't do anything. Spectre Video was established by uh, two guys named Harry Fox and Alex Weiss, and they were uh, watch importers. They were, you know, they were part of the import export, export electronics business. They were bringing in digital watches from Hong Kong. Well, that market was, uh, you know, falling apart by the the early '80s, and so they did a, a pivot into video games, and then decided that they would do their own home computer because, you know, they're making this decision. These decisions, like right before home computers made it big because you know it takes them a while to get everything together so i mean before the vic 20 is big before the ti-99 is big you know they're they're starting to to think of doing this when when home computers at the time were like the zx80 you know i mean just really primitive things and so they partnered with a manufacturer in hong kong that they had worked with on watches named bondwell uh and they were based in hong kong they were a new york company but they were personally based in hong kong uh, but they wanted to make kind of a splash uh, in terms of their recognition with this computer that they were building. And so they wanted Microsoft to do the software for it, the operating system, the languages, whatever. So they start trying to contact people at Microsoft to get their attention to want to do this. And they're also contacting because they're in Hong Kong. They're working in the Far East as well. So they finally end up getting a hold of Kei Nishi. Uh, founder of ASCII Corporation, who also was essentially Microsoft Japan. It's complicated. And told them that they were working on this machine, which became the uh, the first one here, the SV318. Uh, yeah. yeah, the SV318. And Nishi had been wanting for at least a little bit at that time to create an 8-bit microcomputing standard because he saw that IBM 
that the IBM PC was going to become the business standard and the 16-bit standard in computers. And he thought it would be great if there were a similar standard for 8-bit computers that could be peddled as a starter computer, just like home computers were, uh, something that you would bring into the home, and that would prolong the life of the 8-bit market, even with IBM taking over. And so he'd been thinking about doing a standard, and then out of the blue, these guys are offering a partnership with Microsoft on an 8-bit computer, and he's like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. So they actually uh, they actually licensed the, the Spectre Video technology and worked with Spectre Video to make changes. The SV318 and, and its follow-up computer, or 328 or whatever mm. it is, are not MSX compatible. They're not part of the standard because they made some fundamental changes to the BIOS and some other stuff uh, when they were creating the MSX standard. But this system right here is the beginning of that. So it's it's literally not a coincidence that it has the same hardware as the MSX because it, for all intents and purposes, it is the MSX, just not software compatible. Gotcha. Okay. Because, I mean, I was just, my whole thing was, and I didn't know that connection, but when I saw that joystick and my best buddy mm-hmm. in uh, in uh, middle school and high school, he had an MSX. Uh, Mm -hmm. when I was living in Argentina. And so I spent a tremendous amount of time playing on that system and those four directional buttons. And they're not directional buttons. They form a square, but they're triangles pointing Mm -hmm. inward. That it looked so disturbingly similar. I was like, there's, there's gotta be a relationship here. When I saw the the hardware specs, I was like, it's identical. Now, granted, the ColecoVision isn't that far off in the SG-1000. I mean, they all three of the systems yes. have such similar S- hardware. It's so, scary. Exactly. So we, we haven't been able to to prove a com- conclusive link yet between ColecoVision and the Spectre video system. Yeah. My guess is that the Spectre video people chose that configuration because of ColecoVision. And we haven't been able to prove it yet on the Sega end either, but almost certainly the SG-1000 and the SC-3000, because the computer was was the initial configuration and then they devaulted into the SG-1000, was almost certainly chosen because of the ColecoVision, because not only was Sega licensing all of their arcade games to Coleco, but uh, for a time period, Sega was supposed to release the ColecoVision in Japan, the license... They signed the licensing deal. It never actually happened, but they were so tight with them. So I think the ColecoVision is probably the the starting point for all of these systems. Mm. Can't prove it, but it it is definitively true uh, as far as we know that that the the Spectre video computer hardware is the the basis for the MSX hardware because both the Both the Spectre Video people said it back in the day, and and Kei Nishi has said it in interviews even more recently. In fact, it's kind of interesting, another slight tangent, but, you know, the MSX2 has, and going forward, there's a a Yamaha uh, graphics chip in there instead of the Texas Instruments. Uh, And that was actually what uh, Nishi wanted to use all along, but it wasn't quite ready yet. And Nishi was content, uh, I think, just wait for it. But the Spectre Video people were pushing for him to get something out sooner, I think, because the company was not doing great. And they saw this as a way to keep going. Uh, And so at least according to Nishi in interviews he gives today, you know, they went ahead and did the MSX with the the 9918 chip. But he personally considers the MSX2 to be kind of the real MSX because that was the graphics chip he had been planning to use all along. Yeah, and but that graphic chip that, it would have been difficult <laughs> to get it out before eighty six or eighty seven. I mean, it would exactly. have been very, very difficult. And I mean, it's a much uh, it's it's a different world that graphic chip. Absolutely. So we can we can blow through the rest of the list yeah. here, but but Spectre Video deserved a little love, and of course Spectre Video did release an MSX uh, computer. As really, well. they launched one in the U.S. I don't know that it was in the U.S. I don't recall, okay. but they did create one. It may not have been gotcha. in the U.S. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, no, and and it's definitely something we'll cover. And we did cover um, a Sega's uh, license deal with uh, ColecoVision uh, last year. It was uh, There was headlines mm-hmm. about it. But, yeah, then it never, obviously never comes to fruition. But, okay, 
Let's do the rest. Atari's 1200XL retooling of their 8-bit home computer line will retail for $899. And not be fully backwards compatible, so whoops. Yeah, so ton of money, uh, <laughs> way too much money for 1970s technology, and you thought the Aquarius was the computer of the 70s. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Oh, well. Uh, then we've got Mattel showed off the Aquarius, speaking of, a computer we have yes. already spent enough time deriding on the show, and we will no doubt get to deride some more when it's discontinued soon. And you just derided it a second ago before we even <laughs> talked about it. Yeah, what can I say? The Aquarius is just, <laughs> I, and I don't know why I have such hate for the system. It's just, and I've never even used one, but just looking at that keyboard. Those little half keys. It's just, I, I feel the pain of using it, just looking at it. Oh, well. Uh, Texas Instruments TI-99-2, the sub, <laughs> I, I, I wrote here by accident, sub $10, but no, <laughs> that'll be two yes. months from now. No, just kidding. The sub, <laughs> the sub $100, 4.2 kilobyte system that we talked about last month. They also showed off the CC40, a 6K mini design with an LCD display system designed for productivity with business graphics, finance, and perspective drawing packages on cartridge. List price for the system, $250. Yeah, that was, there was a there was a brief rage for for small business LCD computers, Sharp and Casio, and and that lot uh, were were doing them. Uh, obviously, never went anywhere long term. And and yeah, the TI ninety nine two was a great idea when a, a TI ninety nine four A was you know a million dollars. But but then a TI ninety nine two four A could be had for like sub one hundred dollars practically so yeah the ti 992 services were no longer required. yeah yeah it's it uh, i don't believe it's going to hit the market and uh, it doesn't make any sense <laughs> and uh i mean it would have been a great zx81 killer if anybody still cared about the zx81 by mid 1983 but that's another issue entirely and instead, the can be home computer price wars were a good <laughs> exactly <laughs> killer for what was in the United States the Timex Sinclair one thousand. It was the ZX. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it, it's it, these people. Oh well. But then again, you have to make these decisions. You know, maybe a year ahead of time, and nobody expected the market to be in this condition at this point. No, it, it made sense. And I mean, the, the, like the Timex Sinclair 1000 made a killing at yeah. first because there was a market for a computer that cheap. It just turned out that the expensive computers decided it was their job to fill it <laughs> and profit margins be damned. Uh, Jack Trammell. Okay. Now, and one last contender, Video Technology USA has shown off the VZ100, a 3K Z80 machine with the same Motorola graphics chip as the Coco. The machine would get various international rebrandings and hit the U.S. market as the VZ100. I believe Video Technology is, is another one of those Hong Kong manufacturers, you know, that does cheap electronics, oh, yeah. so... That's, you know, they they were trying to fill that that cheap market, you know, like so many were, you know, Panasonic's going to get in on it as well. And then it turned out that the expensive computers filled that cheap market. So all of those hopes and dreams were dead. Well, in, in many ways, this is what Jack wanted. He wanted to mm -hmm. declare it originally to the Japanese, but it's going to apply to the mm -hmm. Taiwanese as well. You know, I'm going to come in so cheap. Don't even try. And that's why the VIC-20 first yep. launches in Japan. Yes, you indeed. Know, it's he, he, That was him sending a shot across the bow. Don't even try. This price category is mine. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah, all these other guys are going to try, and it's not going to fare well, at least in the U.S. market. Exactly. But it's not all about a race to the bottom of the market, because there are still some people trying to capture that really, really ridiculous high-end need-the-corporate-platinum American Express card uh, to purchase computers. And uh, this month, Byte, 
looks at the Lisa. Byte magazine goes into detail about the Lisa, Apple's first GUI-driven computer. The marvel of having individual quote-unquote sheets of paper on screen with different types of information that can be moved around with a pointing device called a mouse is a true innovation in making computers accessible. The decision to have the 68000 processor running at just 5 instead of 8 MHz handle all the graphics is questioned by the writer of the article, but apparently this made it easier to access the 32K of video memory. Yeah, so, you know, Lisa. Well, uh, and uh, let me just... A steal of $10,000. Yeah, $10,000 is, uh, is, is, is the price tag on this machine, which is absolutely insane. Uh, second, just to clarify here, and I, I, I did a, as much digging as I could on short notice with this, but that 5 megahertz, um, 68,000, was not chosen because it made accessing the memory easier. It's because the thing was in development for so long that they had timed everything to run off of this because they did not have the money to invest in custom GPU or a graphics chip. Instead, they had to run it through the processor and changing the megahertz would have meant reconfiguring all the software to get the timings right for the screen uh, refresh. And so they just basically hobbled the machine in order to do this, a machine that's trying to do a GUI on 32K of video memory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this, this is just not, not going to happen. I mean, uh, I've never used the Lisa personally. I've seen video of it being used, and it actually makes running GOS on a Commodore 128 look like <laughs> yeah it's like everything's running in slow motion it's scary um yeah, yeah. it's 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 not going to go well uh now interesting the article does point out that this builds on the Xerox Park uh developments mm -hmm. so anybody with the myth in their head that you know this was something brand new that nobody had ever seen before the people at byte are very very well aware and we've already talked on the show before how a year or two ago xerox did have a gui based system that was even more expensive than this if that's possible yeah <laughs> but that was strictly for uh you know businesses putting doing uh, things like layouts of pages and so forth so it was really thought of already for the uh, on the desktop publishing er arena, and the Apple IIe yeah. also gets reviewed in the same magazine. They actually share the cover of those two machines, and it's basically just an Apple II with all the standard add-ons included. So it's kind of like the in Intellivision II at this point. We're just doing you know throwing in all the stuff that you would normally expect anyway. Absolutely, and of course, this is really you know. The one that gives the Apple computer the longevity, mm. um, you know, throughout. I mean, I talked about this on on my podcast before, but our uh, Jeffrey and I are our K through eight school that we were in middle school at the time, uh, but it was K through eight school um, until they built a new wing with a new computer lab in nineteen ninety. Five, still in their computer lab for their computer instruction it was all apple twos and of course by that time you know they were apple two e's yeah and i mean outside of the united states these machines are irrelevant for all practical mm. intents and purposes absolutely but inside the united states and we've talked already on the show over the last year how uh, Apple has been lobbying Congress to give them, you know, better tax incentives for donating machines. And they've been pushing the machines in the schools uh, concept. And this is what's going to keep the Apple II somewhat relevant in certain areas when, let's face it, if you put an Apple II next to a Commodore 64, other than disk access speed, which is important. 
uh, it gets trounced on every level. There's no reason this machine from 77 is going to be relevant uh, in the 80s. But even if you add a bunch of extra memory, just the graphics and the sound are just not good, to put it mildly. And but and yet in the mid-1990s, my school, which was a really good school. I was a public school, not a private school, but it was actually overall a... Yeah, the, one of the best school districts in, in the region. They were still having us learn how to program and logo with the little turtle. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> in the early 1990s. Hey, I I learned how to program 1994 on IBM XTs, monochrome, Turbo huh. Pascal. Uh, so, you know, hey, you don't need more than that to learn how to program. I, I, I but, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> but we digress. Speaking of those uh, IPM PCs, though, though not specifically the XT, PC upgraders pose a problem for IBM. An increasing number of entrepreneurs are buying minimum spec IBM PCs, which come with just 16 kilobytes of RAM and no disk drives. Upgrading them with cheap memory and drives and reselling them for the same price as decked out IBM models or even at a discount and pocketing up to $400 per machine. IBM realized this was happening when machines came in for warranty work for failed components that were not IBM in origin. Byte speculates that IBM may have to go the same route as Apple and only offer fully stocked models of their machines. I I was not aware of this, but that is absolutely hilarious. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, I knew they had a basic model that just had a cassette drive and no no disk drive, but I I didn't know that resellers were in this racket. Oh yeah, yeah. And this is this was funny, but it also made absolute sense because IBM mm-hmm. is charging. They're adding an extra charge on top of every one of these elements that they're putting in there, even though they're not manufacturing virtually any of them themselves. And, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that really, really cheap base 16 kilobytes. Oh, my God. Trying to run DOS on 16 kilobytes. I'm just imagining even DOS 1.0. Insane. But, you know, it. It there's a business here. There there's a business of you know we can, this thing is an open box. We can put whatever we want into it. Let's go for it. All we need is that BIOS. And I mean, at this point, we've yeah. already talked a month or two ago. They did the first impressions in Byte Magazine of the Compaq, so that's already on its way. Uh, the the first true compatible. It's not on the market yet, but they've done the first uh, hands-on impressions of it. So, yeah, it's all this is coming. Yep. And uh, more than that is coming because uh, IBM is going abroad. After holding back on international market distribution for the PC, IBM has announced that they will be marketing the PC in Europe and the Middle East through their Scotland factory. IBM has hinted that they have 50,000 pre-orders and could easily exceed 200,000 units sold in Europe in 1983. Going after Commodore, the gold standard in business machines in the European market oh, yeah. at this time. And, and you know what? It's going to it's gonna be a little bit before IBM actually catches up. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, in yep. Europe, they're going to have a much harder time selling that just because they don't have the distribution yet. They don't have the name mm-hmm. recognition, and uh, and pr- and the European purchasers are going to be much more price sensitive. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, Popular Computing Weekly, the UK broadsheet, reports that the European version of the PC will have higher specs than the base USA version at 64K of RAM and 160K disk drives. I wonder why that's happening. <laughs> maybe some lessons learned uh yeah maybe well i mean and you know i'm when i was th- writing this i was thinking i can imagine that uh big purchasers big retailers like the sears computer centers which we just talked mm-hmm. 
and our last episode, 30 Year Jump, just closed down in 1993. Uh, if they put in their orders for these base machines, they would have put them in like six or seven months beforehand. They'd have these on back order. They'd have stocks of them sitting around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It makes sense that those are still part of the – at least of the inventory available for purchase in the US and that IBM – may not even be producing them any longer in, in the States. They just, you know, still have the inventory sitting around. Yep. No, it was definitely a sign of things to come, though the real harbinger of things to come uh, was, was also happening right now because Intel begins work on the 386. Last month, we talked about the unveiling of the 286 chip, which will go on sale in 1983. And Intel has announced that they have begun work on the 80386. The device won't begin shipping until 1985, but clearly Intel is not looking to sit on their laurels. Yep. There, there, there are two big things here m that are more future looking, but we'll, we'll say them anyway. First of all, because of the lead time in designing a chip, I mean, is, is this, as you just said, you know, this, they're starting to design in 83 and it won't begin shipping until 85. This is the first chip that Intel is working on with the PC in mind. True. The 286, even though it came out after the PC, the design work was done before the PC, and it's it's almost a, a twist of fate, an accident, that Intel becomes this processor standard, because in the 8-bit, they got killed by uh, Zilog with yeah. the Z80. And Moss, yeah. And, well, you know, I mean, other chips were also, uh, no, I mean, obviously the Moss 6502 and Motorola's in there, but what I meant specifically by that is the Z80 was the Intel 8-bit chip, mm. except better. And so the Z80 just shoved all of Intel's 8-bit stuff almost completely out of the market. True. But then they got picked by IBM for the PC. And that's the real beginning of the Intel rise to dominance of microprocessors. But the 286 was not a very good chip for PCs. And neither, neither was the 8088, really, because neither one was designed with the needs of a PC in mind. But the 386 was. So this was going to be a huge leap forward for the PC ecosystem going to the 386. And it was the moment that IBM really started losing the market because Compaq could see that the 386 was going to be a huge leap forward for the PC market. And so Compaq beat IBM to market. Obviously, this is future looking. This no, is no, 83. of course not. With the first 386 PC compatible. Really? And that was that, yes, Compaq had the first one and they, they deliberately, they knew what they were doing. Mm. They knew it was such a big leap forward that if they beat IBM to market, that that would, you know, be a big deal. And, and that was the true beginning of the end of, of IBM versus the clone makers is is when Compaq was able to get out first. So this this 386 that's uh, starting to be worked on, I mean, this is momentous. It is going to truly change the world of, of personal computing. Yeah. Well, and the 386 is the moment when the, this thing is so much more powerful. Motorola is going to basically, we, and we talked about this also a month or two ago in the 30-year jump, mm -hmm. how they're going to have to jump an entire generation of their chips just to have a hope yep. of being at the same level. And because Motorola dragged their feet, it's one of the motivations for Apple and IBM getting together to create the power PC. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so Intel has seen that they need to jump on this and they will. And, and of course, uh, the the other thing is that the 386 changes and and leads to the longest litigation and most legendary litigation in Silicon Valley history is for the first time a microprocessor, at least from a major company, I don't know if it's the first ever, but certainly the first important microprocessor will not be second sourced to another company for manufacturing. It'll be sole source to IBM, leading along with some other things to the long-running AMD v. Intel <laughs> litigation. 
Yes, and and we've and we've hinted at some of that in our thirty year jumps, but it's definitely going to come home to roost uh, in the next few years. It'll be fun. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So a little little sneak preview on that mm-hmm. one. Uh, but moving back to present concerns, Tandy cuts Coco price. Tandy, parent company of Radio Shack, has announced that the price of their TRS color computer, aka the Coco, will drop from $399 to just $299. No doubt a reaction to the ever more competitive home computer market. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, the Coco was always kind of an also ran to the, the VIC-20, Commodore 64, Atari 8-bit TI-99, but they didn't necessarily feel a huge amount of pressure because of that, since they were their own retail ecosystem, they could just kind of do their own thing. So yeah, they have to cut the price to remind people like, hey, we're out here too, you can buy us, but they they don't get fully sucked in to that ruinous price war in the same way that the the majors do. But it's definitely all coming from the same pressure in the home computer. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, there's probably also a little bit of, you know, well, we can reduce the cost now because manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, it's, yep. it's you know, we, we have to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they do one or two more price cuts along the way, but never, never as extreme as, as the competition, which is literally eating itself <laughs> throughout this entire period. Very true. Uh. But uh, meanwhile, there is a new home computer revolution about to start across the pond because the ZX Spectrum hits retail. Even though I'm American, it it feels wrong. I always call it the ZX81, the ZX Spectrum, because it just feels wrong, even as an American, to call it the ZX Spectrum, you know? Yeah, you wouldn't say I'm going to have a nice cup of sake. Sake. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, so, you know, even to an American like me, this is the ZX. It, as, as, it, as it should be. After many delays, defective early batches of machines, and slow mail order, Sinclair has finally gotten the ZX Spectrum into retail outlets in England. And it's not just any. This is going to be... It starts out exclusively at WH Smith, which is a Mm -hmm. news agent. So it's basically the place where you go to buy magazines and newspapers. And a major high street retailer. The number of locations is so important here. And they're all high traffic locations because that's where you want to sell newspapers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, say what you will about Margaret Thatcher. And believe me, I could say a lot. Uh, One thing that she did that is somewhat positive is this idea that technology is going to be part of the new Britain and by promoting technology so heavily in the schools with the BBC micro and whatnot, uh, even though the BBC micro was out of reach of the average consumer to actually bring home, it gave great permission to the public to buy a cheaper computer for their children so that they, they wouldn't fall behind in whatever this new Britain was supposed to be. And so, you know, the ZX Spectrum, it, it launches a, a bedroom coder movement that we are still feeling the impact of in, in the modern video game industry today. Oh, so. definitely. I mean, so many marvelous gaming innovations come out of it. I mean, just alone games like Elite and uh, Lords of Midnight, uh, Whizball, and all these other, uh, other just off the wall, beautiful ideas. And it's mm-hmm. because of this freewheeling, totally anarchic uh, industry that pops up. I mean, reading through the magazines at this point, there there was an article this month in one of the British mags about, you know, it should, you know, should we have protection for game ideas? You know, where would we be if not everybody could make their own version of Pac-Man and stuff like this? And uh, there they're having this real debate about the ideas of the stuff. They're a couple years behind everybody else, but at the same time, there's a bill that the industry is trying to push. We talked about this a couple months ago, and it's also on in every weekly issue of Popular Computer uh, Weekly this month about, you know, will, will the government grant a one-year moratorium on the import of all foreign-made computers in England? 
Mm -hmm. That's something that they're pushing for because (laughs) they want this to be their own industry and Sinclair is the only one that is against it because he's selling a ton of machines in the States. (laughs) Exactly. And I just, you know, while we're on the subject of ZX Spectrum, I have to shout shout out the movie Micromen. If you haven't seen it, you got to see it. It's great uh, about the rivalry between Clive Sinclair and his uh, former protege, uh, Chris Curry, played by Martin Freeman. And, you know, when I first, you know, yeah, it's so good. And it's like there were some ridiculous things in there. It's like they just put this in for them. There's no way that Chris Curry and Clive Sinclair got into a fist fight in a pub after a computer trade show. And then I went and looked it up and they did. So (laughs) it's a crazy movie, but most of it is actually Mm -hmm. true. They they fudge a little here and there as any movie does, but most of it is actually true. Well, uh, (laughs) the haunting image in that movie for me is still... When Chris Curry goes into this giant warehouse full of electrons, and mm. there, there's no way they can sell them because, uh, again, this mo- uh, this month there was an interview, and I didn't include all of this because, I mean, a lot of this stuff isn't big mo- uh, movements or big news. It's stuff we've already talked about on the show previously, but there's this whole interview with Curry – where he's trying to explain that the delay in the electron isn't really a problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And it's, you know, it'll be great when it comes out. Don't worry about it. It's like, dude, you're you're so screwed. You're so screwed. Um, and uh, exactly. No. So, yeah. Uh, lo- love that. Love that. That's definitely one of the best. It'll be interesting to see uh, what the Tetris movie that's, that's – <sighs> coming out literally as we record this any day now uh yeah. but uh for the for the moment micromen has to be the gold standard for a for a dramatization of something that is it's not about video games but it's still video game adjacent. yeah i mean before that i would have said pirates of silicon valley which has some issues but that was my gold mm-hmm. standard up until that point but yeah that's micromen fair. is is phenomenal yeah the tetris movie looks like they may be fudging way too much uh, yeah. but I did love seeing, you know, the OG ASCII based version of Tetris seeing that <laughs> w- almost was worth the price uh, of admission. But the one that I'm actually yeah. more interested I just, in, uh, it just, it, it just, I, I wonder why they couldn't get a single Famicom, uh, on, on the, uh, in that trailer to actually play the Famicom version of Tetris. But, uh, <laughs> that's a whole other story. That, it, <laughs> you think they would have gotten into trouble if they showed an actual Famicom? I, well, I don't. Well, it's not they didn't show a Famicom. It's that they didn't show the the gameplay was always from other versions. And quite frankly, it was probably because it was much easier to just do it that way, and nobody except the the super <laughs> knowledgeable circles that we travel in. Leave That's notice. true. No, no, nobody, nobody cares. Even I don't. <laughs> but I, but I still think it's fun. Well, it, yeah, and, the movie uh, I actually think is going to be more interesting is the one about uh, the pinball. I I wonder what that's going to be like because, uh, um, you know, it's great that Roger Sharp went and you know played a round of, uh, chased the old silver ball around for for uh, for a little bit on on the floor of the the city council. But uh, I mean, that was theatrics. The yeah, the groundwork had been laid for years, and quite frankly, at this point, New York didn't care if if it was a gambling game or not. They needed money so badly that they would legalize just about anything that they could justify so that they could, you know, license it and connect, collect the licensing fees. That's probably true. Uh, that is true. But I think if, if you did it accurately and you didn't just do it about the one guy, but you really built up the history of it, I think there's a great yeah. story to tell there. It's probably not going to be that. Absolutely. It's going to be absolute garbage. It's going to be, you know, imitation game nonsense again. Yeah. But – Exactly. But it's it's, it's so interesting too because, I mean, Roger Sharp is uh, in some way att- connected to this movie. Uh, you know, not – he didn't develop the movie but, you know, in giving permissions and whatnot. He's, he's never – he's never tried to bill himself – is the man who saved pinball. I mean, he'll, he'll tell that story to people who interview him. I mean, Ethan's interviewed him, but you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not like Ralph Baer and Nolan Bushnell, you know, dueling for the, this title of father of video games. Like Sharp has never wanted to really be known as the man who saved pinball. So it's, it's interesting to get this now. <laughs> and uh, thank you for mentioning that just very briefly, because there is an interview with Ralph Baer in one of the magazines this month where he, 
that's one of the things he's like, I just want to be acknowledged as the guy, you know, who started it all, uh, which uh, just <laughs> right. I didn't add to the stories, but I thought it was worth mentioning since you brought it up. But OK, let's keep moving. We got so much. Left. Well, there you go. And, and you know, it's 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 interesting, you know, with the ZX Spectrum, you know, you mentioned uh, defective early batches of machines. Now, there's this that's something that uh, Sinclair was known for and not the ZX Spectrum, but he has had other uh, uh the electronic devices that he's made that could become quite explosive at times. But surprisingly, we don't have a story here about the ZX Spectrum blowing up. Instead, TI-99 could go a boom. Texas Instruments has revealed that the TI-99 for a computer transformers may, under, quote, certain unusual conditions, end quote, cause a user to suffer an electrical shock or damage to their computer. While they describe this as a, quote, remote possibility, end quote, they are looking at sending out replacement units to users. No word on how this will affect the earnings, but they do expect earnings for the first quarter of 1983 to be below those of the fourth quarter of 1982. Good news, everyone! <laughs> Wall Street's not going to care about some tiny little replacement costs and a small number of your computers by the time you're reporting out your 1983 earnings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is one of the weird things. When they mentioned in the article, and this is a New York Times article, when they started talking about the earnings, I was like, wait a second. Uh <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not a public safety issue. It's a how much are you already losing and how big of a deal is this towards uh, – I mean, you're worried about every little additional cost that's going to hurt the earnings call. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got bigger problems coming. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we can leave that lie for the moment as we transition from hardware into software – Beginning with Michael Katz moves to Epix. Friend of the show, Michael Katz, who helped Mattel enter the electronic games market and later helped launch the ColecoVision, has taken the top job at Epix, formerly known as Automated Simulations. He will be working alongside company co-founder James Connolly, who will remain as chairman. This company currently has revenue of under $10 million, but 40-year-old Mike sees it as a chance to have some equity in a company in a growing new industry, namely computer software. Yeah. So I know we've both interviewed Mike Katz. I have actually also interviewed Jim Connolly. Oh. And I'm, I'm guessing Jim Connolly <laughs> does not see this as the greatest moment in his life when Michael Katz showed up. He was he was against it. Uh, now, I mean, you know, he had brought in VC funding and they had needed VC funding to to expand their product line as the market became more competitive. They were also looking at getting into the cartridge market, not the home console market, but like your big yeah. 20s and the like. And so he brought in the VCs and he was on board with the VCs bringing someone in with more business experience uh, but, you know, of course, they interviewed several people and Mike Katz was not his choice, uh, but he was overruled because, you know, he didn't have the majority vote. And, uh, you know, he he didn't spill tea. He didn't go into great detail, uh, but he was not a fan of Michael Katz. He did not like working with Michael Katz. They had, in his view, very different approaches to things. And he absolutely left the company with most of the programmers to form the Jim Connolly group because he could no longer stand working with Michael Katz. So for whatever that's worth, there 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 were some clashes there. And I believe Michael Katz called him a, quote, nerd uh, in my interview <laughs> with him. And I mean, I, yeah, I haven't talked to uh, Jim Connolly, so I only have the Michael Katz side of the story. But basically, uh, Mike, uh, Mike was coming from uh, Coleco. Uh, had been at Mattel before that, and his – the way he describes it at least is his big innovation was to bring in strategy elements and combine them with action elements. So, right. you know, he takes credit for the idea for Pit Stop, for example. <clears throat> right. And I – Yeah. Credit and, there. Oh, go ahead. I, I can see Yeah. That. I mean, 
it feels like the company was going to probably naturally move in that direction anyway, because uh, they had they had the Jumpman game and no you know, Jumpman they had their strategy games. Jumpman's not out yet. Yeah, yeah no, I, I know, but it, it was it came out before before Connolly left the company. Yeah. Right? Is, is is what I meant. No, no, it had not come out because it's a 1983 game. It had not come out by this point. Uh, but you know that was an outside submission that that Connolly was was pretty enamored with, and so. You know, but yeah, I mean, he he did take them uh, at least from the marketing side. Uh, he very effectively marketed this action strategy game, and there's no doubt that the company grew uh, while he was there. Um, and if Jim Connolly and all of them hadn't left, uh, you know, maybe they don't buy Star Path uh, because they suddenly need programmers, and you know, so that gets them you know into the whole game series essentially. So yeah, you know, I'm not saying Jim Connolly was the one that was right. I'm just saying uh, there was definitely a clash, oh, yeah. and I think it came down to. Uh, reading between the lines of both of our interviews, I think uh, Jim was very uncomfortable with a guy who was so pure marketing, and Mike was uncomfortable with a guy who was so pure programming, <laughs> and it was just a class of personality. Yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> and, and and I think your assessment is correct because, yeah, they they just were never going to function together because Connolly. If you look at Connolly's output, the Abshai games and so forth. He is not looking. Mm-hmm. I mean, even the action games that Epics has released up to this point, nah, they're 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 not really action games, and or at least not competitive action games, and as competitive in the sense of competitive in the marketplace. And mm-hmm. yeah, I I just don't think he had the eye for it, for you know what's going to make a good product. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing yeah, Michael that, that, did have was you know he could see what was going to work. Now, Grandy also d- tries things like the virtual toys with Barbie and GI Joe and Hot Wheels, which don't really yeah, work which... except for GI Joe. Still, eight bit deathmatch two player. There's nothing better than GI Joe on the C sixty four. Interesting. If you haven't played it, just got to try it. It's it's great. Granted, the other half of the game is absolutely terrible because the vehicle modes are just nonsense. But that's another issue. <laughs> okay. Uh, speaking of things that won't work out, Cosme announces try compatible cassette. Cosme has announced that they will be releasing games on both cassette and cartridge that will contain VIC-20, TI-99-4A, and Atari 8-bit versions of their software on the same medium. Oh, look, three computers that are all about to crash and burn at the same time. How delightfully good for Cosme. Well, and, yeah. I mean, the VIC-20 was hugely successful, but it was about to be superseded. Exactly. You know. <laughs> well, and the weird thing here is I couldn't actually find any examples of games released on all three formats on the same medium. Yeah. Uh, now, they do do a lot of Commodore 64 on one side, Atari 8-bit on the other side games. That they do release a ton of, and they're not the only ones. Uh, I I had a bunch of, as a C sixty four owner, I had a bunch of games. Mastertronic did this as well, or they put an Apple II version on the other side. Just I mean, on- I wouldn't be surprised if if this was. I can't see T- Texas Instruments even going for this, and I mean they controlled their platform so thoroughly. You know, you had to be licensed to go on it. They, you know, uh, third parties could not just randomly make stuff on it. And so I can't imagine that they would want something being sold that was also selling versions for competitors' computers. You know, I I don't know, because I agree with you from what they've done. And this is probably just something, a technology or an idea Cosme is showing at the show. Right, exactly. Um, Pie in the sky. And, and, you know, probably looking to see if there's buy-in. Now, obviously, I, I, wh- how would TI be able to control this at this point? Do they have a method of, you know, controlling who d- releases software for the system? I think they j- – I don't think they had a hardware solution for it. I could be wrong. I, I haven't looked into TI, too. I just know you had to be licensed to be on the platform. And obviously, it wasn't exclusivity. It wasn't like the NES thing. I mean, they wouldn't have anything to say if Cosme released a game on their system and also released the same game for those other systems. But I have to imagine they'd be a little uncomfortable with competitors' products being on the same, you know, 
cartridge or cassette. That that's probably true. They, I can't imagine they'd be happy about it. Then again, they might just be desperate enough to you know be like, well, it just means that there's more software out there. But yeah, it's... yeah. So yeah, but I don't know much about this project. And like like you said, I think it was just you know CES and Toy Fair are the time of of hopes and dreams. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> true. But, uh, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, targeting all those platforms at once, a Broderbund goes multi-platform. The increasing number of computer platforms is making even the most stalwart Apple II devotees look to new customers to increase their revenues. Broderbund will be porting some of their games to the Atari 8-bit as well as the VIC-20, as well as creating new titles for these systems, such as a music synth software to take advantage of Commodore's sound chip capabilities. Yeah, I mean, Broderbund did this because everybody was doing this. Um, they didn't get burned by it in the same way that Sierra did or uh, Sirius Software did. I mean, they came out okay. I think Doug probably regrets it a little bit, though, because they, they did take some venture funding as part of preparing to enter the cartridge market, just because that is uh, you know, a much more expensive uh, market to get into with the manufacturing costs. And you know, they, they didn't even really need the venture money, but they got it, and, and some of the decisions that they had to make later in the life of the company to please the venture capitalists. I mean, they never gave up control to the VCs, but... You know, I, I think if Doug had it to do over again, he'd, uh, he'd probably not taken the venture money. And if that meant having to skip the cartridge market, so be it. But, I mean, everyone thought that that's where it was moving. A, a lot of the old line computer software companies were, were investing in cartridge. And Broderbund, thankfully, was so far behind everyone else in investing in cartridge that they didn't get caught in the same <laughs> way that a Sierra or a Sirius did. True, true. And it's, yeah, and they also, I think they were also, yeah, I mean, when you look at Broderbund's catalog at the time, uh, it was strong enough, uh, because Sierra's, I mean, their text with graphics games had already started to decline. Time Zone was a flop. Uh, Dark Crystal would become a flop, and they paid good money for that license. Broderbund yeah. hadn't gone down that path yet. They had things like Choplifter to fall back on. Exactly. Uh, so they were in a better position creatively to weather the storm. Uh, and yeah, but they need to get onto other platforms. The Apple II will not su- uh, support them forever. Exactly. And uh, speaking of getting onto other platforms, TSR gets into video games. Last year, we reported on TSR announcing their intent to get into video games. At the time, I did not know if they actually did and couldn't find a link to the games. This month, in the first issue of Blip, the video game magazine published by Marvel Comics, they have a full-page ad promoting their first three titles, Dawn Patrol, Dungeon, and Theseus and the Minotaur. Dawn Patrol is a World War I flight sim, Dungeon is an adaptation of the board game of the same name, and Theseus is a dungeon crawler. Each of the games is for the Apple II, and they all apparently came out. Yeah, um, I don't know much about these. The definitive history of early TSR has been written by uh, John Peterson, and he barely mentions them. I mean, he acknowledges that they existed and that they came out, but... Uh, the sense that you get from reading what little coverage he had of them is that Gary Gygax was pretty down on this whole computer game thing because D&D was a game about interaction and, and getting together and playing with people and, and computers at the time just couldn't do that. So I'm sure they were getting into the market because everyone was getting into the market. Avalon Hill got into the market. But I don't think they were ever very interested in it. Of course, they licensed Dungeons and Dragons to Mattel, which is why they couldn't even, you know, release D and D games under their their own label here. And I I think they were mostly just fine with letting other people do it, and so they half heartedly waved at it, and then they were like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I'm hoping to get some more insight. Uh, we're mm-hmm. recording on this on Monday. I've already scheduled an interview this Thursday with Bruce Nesmith, who uh, uh, programmed two of the games, Dungeon and Theseus. And uh, he was actually brought into TSR as a programmer. So, mm-hmm. and later on stayed on as a 
pen and paper game developer and went on to a very long career working on the uh, Elder Scrolls titles. So I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out from him what the inside scoop on this little chapter in TSR history was. Uh, and it should be interesting, but it is, you know, it's this quick little blip that I, I, I didn't run across it when I did my original research. I was just looking for D and D licenses and couldn't find yep. anything published by a TSR. And I, and it didn't even occur to me, well, yeah, Mattel's got the license and it would also cover home computers. Uh, but yeah, that was the case. So it'll be interesting to find out what's going on, but it also just shows how big this home computer market is that everybody has to get in. Exactly. Even Virgin gets into games. Richard Branson's Virgin Records has created Virgin Games Limited as a subsidiary to enter the burgeoning software market. He has poached Nick Alexander from Thorn EMI, another music publisher that has recently gotten into computer software. Yeah, so... I mean, pretty prescient to get in at this point. I mean, Thor and EMI was, was already in even before before Virgin was, which is, I'm sure, part of the reason why Branson got in and, and poached Nick Alexander. But, you know, so much of the early movement was bedroom coder. There were very few real corporations in the British uh, market at this point. But, of course, Virgin gets in, and you know, Virgin Games in its initial incarnation, I don't think, really ever does anything that special. But then, of course, when Mastertronic needs more money to take over uh, the entire U- European distribution of the Mega Drive. Uh, you know, they merge with Master Virgin, system. create... Uh, they start off with the Master yeah, System. Yeah, I meant, yeah, then, sorry, Master, yeah. Master System, not Mega Drive. I meant Master System, sorry. Uh, thanks for catching me before Ethan no had to. Um, <laughs> yeah, Master System, you know, they, they essentially merge with uh, Mastertronic and, you know, go from there. Um, though, of course... They sell that off, but yeah, I mean, they did some important stuff in in the '90s, early '90s, late '80s. But yeah, and I recently did an interview with a developer who was with them. Uh, it's up for the Patreon uh, uh, patrons, and he started out as a bedroom coder, got one of his games released through them, and then they brought him on full time to do ports. And mainly graphics. He, he he's had a career on and off in games ever since. And uh, yeah, Virgin isn't going to be a major major player, but uh, it does show an interesting side of the importance of distribu- existing distribution mm-hmm. channels in the very fragmented European market of the time. I mean, the European yep. market is still fragmented today through language barriers in different uh, countries. But back then it was even worse because you didn't even have the single currency and you couldn't really put all the languages on one on one medium. And the market was so small that doing the translation work often didn't pay off. Mm-hmm. So, so, but, you know, the English market isn't really made up yet of software companies, but mm-hmm. we've got Melbourne Houses just launched The Hobbit. You've mm-hmm. got Thorn EMI. You've got Virgin Records. So you've got record labels. You've got... Uh, book publishers those mm-hmm. are the people who are in this very early stage the major players absolutely or at least the ones that have the best chance of becoming major players and yeah and of course and mastertronic is just about to get involved and you know they were in video rentals <laughs> so it, exactly. yeah you can see how those other uh you know distribution outlets are kind of being starting to be co-opted to create this this British industry. So yeah, in that yeah. sense, Virgin getting into games is is a kind of big step forward. Yeah. Palace Palace is going to be another one that starts out that way. Gremlin Graphics is going to start out as a retail store. It's mm-hmm. yeah, it's insane. Absolutely. Uh so I, I can't read what's written here or or Ethan's gonna yell at me, so I have to modify this. Uh Brian Fargo's second gets reviewed. True. Uh, Demon, uh, Demon's Forge by Saber Software gets reviewed in this month's Soft Talk. The game is the Don't second release by Brian <laughs> Fargo of Interplay fame. So this this was the first game that got widespread 
uh, kind of notice. Not that it sold huge numbers of copies, uh, but uh, Brian and uh, Michael Cranford, his uh, buddy uh, later of Bard's Tale fame, uh, did uh, create a game before this together, a Labyrinth of Martagon, which they did bag in Ziploc baggies and sold a very, very small handful of copies. Uh, so this was, in fact, game number two uh, from Brian Fargo, but it's uh, the other one only barely counts. But it was a retail. It wasn't just like he had it on his one computer at home because I, I wouldn't count that. OK. OK. Yeah, because Soft Talk actually does ta- uh, meant calls it the first game by this new company. The, the, oh, so the company's new. Labyrinth of Martagon was not released through Saber Software. Ah, so the, see, ha ha. It but is it's, the but first it's not, game by but Saber Software, but yes. not the first game by Brian Fargo. Exactly. Okay, I can deal with that. Yep. So, you know, Brian Fargo is an interesting guy because he was somehow both a jock and a nerd. I don't know how you do that, but he was a track star. He hung out with the athletes and he also had a Magnavox Odyssey and geeked out about text adventures. It's, I mean, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to have known his secret uh, when <laughs> I was growing up, <laughs> right? Um, and yeah, he he loved both text adventures and uh, RPGs. He figured his programming ability was uh, more up to a text adventure than an RPG. Uh, Cranford did not help on Demon's Forge as he did on on Labyrinth and would later on Bard's Tale. And uh, he did, uh, just as uh, Wild Bill uh, Staley would do for Microprose, he used the time-honored tactic of taking out an ad for Demon Forge and then calling around to stores saying, Hey, do you have the new game Demon Forge? I really, it looks really cool. And they'd be like, no, we don't, but we'll look into that. And then they'd call, you know, Saber and... Uh, order the game. So it, it it wasn't a widespread release, but it was it was a more formal start to his his business dealings than than Labyrinth was, Labyrinth of Mardigan. Gotcha. Okay, so the first semi professional game released by Brian Fargo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you I, I know Ethan would have been all over that one. He'd been like, ah ah second <laughs> <laughs> so I dig it. I, I dig it. I this could not do we, the line. I could why, not say the line is written. <laughs> this is why he is our um, uh, warden of the Department of Corrections. <laughs> Absolutely, and and he does great work. Yes. Uh, but meanwhile, save money. I have no good transition here. Save money on expensive adventure game dice. Have you ever thought that D and D was swell, but that those damn dice cost way too much money? Well, McKelvey Programs has a solution for you. Their new Game Master utility will take over the load of buying and rolling those dice and some other Game Master duties for you. All you'll need is a Timex Sinclair 1000 or ZX81 with at least 1K of memory and a screen and the patience of angels to use that keyboard. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, now the... Uh, a, the quote expensive adventure game dice comes directly from the ad copy for the game <laughs> okay there's a link to the ad uh, where it's got this little knight and this dragon and it's like uh, are you tired of expensive adventure game dice and I'm just like what <laughs> uh, in fairness they were kind of expensive back then because before D and D, you didn't really need most of those dice, even in like other war games and stuff. And so, they weren't really mass produced. You know, TSR actually got into the dice business themselves in part because it was so hard to to get the dice. So, uh, more expensive than buying a Sinclair, a Timex Sinclair one thousand, uh, and worth all of the frustration of using a Timex Sinclair one thousand. Well, no, probably not. Uh, a little silly to say expensive adventure game dice. Yes, definitely a little silly, but not as silly in the context of the times as it would be to say that today. This is true. And back then you were probably still using the so-called mud dice, which mm. wore, wore, off, wore down yes. the edges over time and so forth. This is true. But yeah, it's just, I mean, granted, 
uh, SSI is also going to have their Dungeon Master tools for uh, the C64 and the Apple II later on, which yes. may or may not have had a productive use at the time. Uh, <laughs> Now, granted, when I was running games uh, back in college, I always had a laptop and did all my dungeon mastering on the laptop. Totally legit. Yeah. Once yep. you have an LCD screen, but when mm-hmm. you have a CRT, kind of pointless. But oh well. Yeah. But we'll be moving on now from this world of uh, computer software and uh, dipping our toes ever so briefly into what constitutes the handheld market as Nintendo launches Game & Watch in North America. After a lackluster debut through Mego, Nintendo has relaunched their Game & Watch series of LCD handhelds in North America. Yeah, obviously humongously successful in Japan, I think decently successful in Europe. Uh, word is not too successful in the United States. Game Over really harps on it. Not everything in Game Over is correct, but he talks about a pretty, you know kind of shoddy marketing campaign with uh, not using professional actors in the television commercials and all of that. I talked to Bruce Lowry, uh, who was head of uh, sales at Nintendo of America at the time, and he kind of pushed back against that. He was like, no, it was fine. It was successful. And it probably was from a bottom line perspective. As as consumers, sometimes we, we like to say, well, you know, the Game Gear was a failure because the Game Boy sold, you know, 80 million copies or whatever, and the Game Gear sold 11 million or whatever it was. And it's like, okay, but I think on 11 million units, Sega probably turned a profit. <laughs> yeah, just just a little, just a little. <laughs> so it's kind of unfair to call that a failure. So, uh, you know, they were fine, but definitely it's fair to say they did not have the impact in North America that they did in some other markets where they just, you know, were huge phenomenons. Well, there was also a lot more competition at that point in the North American market. Penetration mm-hmm. of consoles was so much greater, so it's not like you know this was your only way of playing games. I mean, yes, it's and just a different ball game. Yeah, and the handheld market had largely turned. I mean, there were other companies trying to market LCD handhelds in in the U.S., but you know that that whole transition from the LED to the LCD time period in the United States. By the time LCD was really picking up steam. The North American market had kind of left handhelds behind because video games had gotten popular. The Japanese market in this period of time uh, was always two or three years behind the American market. You know, they had their Pong console boom two to three years after America did. Uh, Then here they had their handheld boom about two or three years after America did. And and then they would have their console boom two or three years after America did. And and then they would take over the world. But that's another story. (laughs) And setting up that story, well, it's a slightly different thing, but uh, Replay Magazine, the coin-op trade, has a profile of Nintendo in conjunction with the Popeye arcade game, which they reveal that they will be launching a new line of color tabletop games, which will be the Panorama Screen line. And I did not know that these existed until I saw this. Uh, have you ever seen these? Panorama my, Screen? My, my... My copies of uh, Gorge's uh, History of Nintendo probably have pictures in them, but uh, and it's not something I'm overly familiar with, no. Okay, uh, they basically, they're, they they kind of look a little similar to, uh, the, the basic idea is the same as the Coleco Mini Arcade, mm-hmm. only that the screens that they're using are actually detailed and look cartoony and are fun looking and it's it's yeah it's a whole different caliber of title and they're going to be using some of the same characters but obviously not uh copying the same games as what they've already licensed out okay so these are like i pulled out i I pulled out my gorge. So these are like their their Donkey Kong Jr., their Mario Cement Factory, those those yeah. games. Mm-hmm. And yeah, my yeah, my gorge books have pictures, but very interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's just you know, it's it's just one of those things where I'm just like, hmm, that existed. That's cool. Uh, But, you know, and I guess the reason I brought this up is because we talked a few months ago here on the show 
about how Nintendo got permits to expand their uh, their facilities outside of Seattle. And one right. of the purposes that they mentioned was the introduction of video game systems for retail purposes. I can't remember the exact language of it, but it basically came down to that. So they're clearly talking about getting into some kind of non-exclusively arcade or toy business. Uh, right. And so the fact that this is the next product line that they're bringing over, that they're starting with the handhelds, would fit in with that plan of going bigger. Now, whether or not that's all or an indication that they're working on the Famicom is another issue entirely, but it it would it wouldn't surprise me that they've at least have it on the horizon at this point. Yeah, by eighty three they're working on the Famicom. We have yeah. we have some some timelines. Um yeah, absolutely. Well that wraps up the the fast fading handheld market. Now let's move on to let's 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 lawyers chat a little bit. I've I've never practiced, but I've got the degree too. So yay! <laughs> let's let's have some lawyer talk here. There's another one of us here. <laughs> Massachusetts judge calls game content, and I quote, inconsequential. Unquote. Nicely done. In an attempt to have a decision by a licensing commission denying an application to open an arcade overturned, Frank Caswell appealed to the Massachusetts State Supreme Judicial Court, arguing that the denial was a violation of his First Amendment rights. He argued that the games were the expression of the game's authors, ideas, and fantasies, and thus should be protected. The court rejected this argument, saying, quote, Any communication or expression of ideas that occurs during the playing of a video game is purely inconsequential. End quote. <laughs> Yeah, very interesting. Uh, I was I was not particularly uh, aware of this case. Um, obviously, the U.S. Supreme Court many decades later came to a to a different opinion on this. That's interesting. I mean, I'd have to you know I'd have to look at the briefs. I mean, if he's arguing that the game that they have First Amendment rights because. You know the the expressions of the author of the authors. That why does he have standing to bring that argument? Because, I mean, I understand that he's harmed by the fact that they're not licensing it. But his argument sounds like he's not arguing that his First Amendment rights were violated. He's arguing that the creator's First Amendment light rights were violated. I mean, he does have standing, but it's just kind of interesting that he took that. Well, it it would be approach. similar to. Um and and obviously, I haven't read the briefs either, so a lot of this, yeah. please do not take it as legal advice, especially on a case that's 40 <laughs> years old that has already been supplanted yeah. by other decisions. But uh, similar to the way that a, uh, a movie, a movie uh, theater owner who gets mm -hmm. arrested for showing something can sue – uh, it, it can defend themselves on First Amendment grounds because sure, sure. even though they didn't create the work, it's about the d display of the work or comic book right. um, stores. You know, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, that's the foundation there as well. You know, you can't go after them for just selling it because right. of that First Amendment right to speech. Uh, so I guess that's the argument he's making here. And at least the yep. way that it's portrayed in uh, the trade publication Games People uh, their uh, the way that this quote was set up, and this is a quote. Th these are the words from the decision as quoted by games people. So hopefully they haven't taken them out of context. Yeah. Is you know the judge just saying, you know, any ideas in out uh, in a game are inconsequential. They're not important. I have to take games people on their face because I could not find the case either. Uh, but it sounds to me like you know they're just poo pooing the idea that yeah the 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 ship's blowing each other up not important right. enough on this issue of licensing. But yeah, it's I just thought it was kind of funny and also indicative in many ways of how the courts are going to see the content of games or how society sees the content of games at this point in time. Yeah, because, and I mean, it is, 
you know, I mean, even though he kind of they or they kind of ruled on the First Amendment thing because the defense was brought up. I mean, it's not it's not really a First Amendment. I mean, it's a it's a zoning case. And I mean, the Supreme Court has limited the ability in the past of like adult entertainment places to open up wherever they want. Like it's OK to regulate certain things on a zoning basis, even if there's you know, on a licensing basis, even if there is an expression there. So I, I wonder if that might have, have hurt his case as well. The Supreme Court may not have really been taking the argument seriously within the context of the case, if that makes sense. That is that is definitely a possibility. I mean, this, this sentence could also be interpreted as just being, you know, it doesn't matter how great the ideas are. That's inconsequential to the question, can the Zoning Commission limit where you're going to put this Business. Exactly, because in the context of the decision, they might have narrowly been saying that in in terms of you know, the state's interest in licensing and you know exercising their police power in that way. Because you know, I mean, if you know, if um, if adult dancing, you know, strip stripping, erotic dancing, whatever you want to call it, I mean, that's that's a, a form of expression. But the the court has ruled that yes, it's okay. For, for a city to say, you can't have that here, <laughs> that it violates our zoning because there's there's a government interest in in maintaining. And uh, we have to remember that video arcades were seen as very similar to something like a casino uh, where slot machines are and whatnot. And, you know, obviously you, you have a floor show in a casino. That's an artistic expression. Uh, you know, Cirque du Soleil is performing at a casino. They're putting on an artistic display, but a city could still say, you know, your casino can't be here. <laughs> so, yeah, I have to wonder how how seriously they were really considering the First Amendment impact when they decided this case. Probably not much. But then again, it, it makes for a great clickbait. So it, it, had, to, <laughs> it, it had to be included here, you know. <laughs> it does. And, I, and, you know, and I mean, they did they did say something about it. But I, you know, and that was, you know, good on Frank here for trying a novel uh, – novel approach but and you know obviously games weren't as narrative based then and judges are older and so you know that could have played into it as well but i mean yeah it is interesting it is it is a side note at some point if we do run into the actual decision it might be fun to read it in its entirety but for right now yep absolutely Right now, however, we're going to move on as GCC, General Computer Corporation, seeks a piece of Pac-Man merch pie. Or I suppose Ms. Pac-Man merch pie, more specifically. Yeah, yeah. General Computing Corporation, the company whose crazy auto modification board for Pac-Man was reworked into Ms. Pac-Man, is apparently trying to profit from that relationship. While according to Midway, GCC has made millions off of the deal in royalties, Midway is asking a court to grant them a declaratory judgment, temporary restraining order, and a preliminary injunction against GCC that would permanently enjoin them from, quote, asserting publicly any right to the Ms. Pac-Man or Baby Pac-Man characters, end quote and from, quote, interfering with any license agreement or business transaction between Mid Midway and any other party, including any licensee or prospective licensee under any right owned by Midway in the Ms. Pac-Man video game, end quote. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, not quite sure what GCC was trying to do, if anything. Or if Midway is just basically being overly cautious that they might be trying to do something. Right. You know, it, it's it's a little hard to say. Uh, but it I kind of has this feeling like, you know, okay, GCC did the Crazy Auto thing once. We shut them down by buying it off of them. Are we worried that they might want to do this again, or are we worried that they're going to try to sue us and claim partial ownership of these characters that they created? You know? Yep. And, uh, you know, 
GCC has to fight this battle over and over again over the course of, of many decades. But uh, in the end, not anywhere near this time, in the end, it does turn out that, uh, you know, they do uh, they do have some of those rights, which is why uh, Ms. Pac-Man has suddenly vanished, not just like the game Ms. Pac-Man, but the character of Ms. Pac-Man has completely vanished. There is a new Pac family in Namco Land, and it's because... They would have to pay royalties. Oh no! To really? GCC. Yeah, I didn't know that. And this is in they the finally. It wasn't this CGI case series. Yeah. yeah. So you know, there's what is it? Pac Mama? Is that what it is now, or whatever? I forget. Pac Mama. I forget what the name that, of the character that's, is. That I don't. I don't. Terrible. Uh, that may be the wrong name. It might be Pac Mom. I can't remember. I'm trying to look it up frantically. I don't. I don't respect the lore. Uh, <laughs> Let's I think it's see. Pac-Mom. Yes, Pac-Mom is the new, essentially, Ms. Pac-Man, uh, because GCC finally was able to assert their rights over the Pac family, the original Pac family. Oh, wow. Uh, but, it was, but it was a much later case. They, they actually sued at games, you know, the maker of the plug-and-play consoles. Ah, well, I remember that story where the... Uh... The plug and play, and I think it was the One Up arcade cabinets, had to be taken off the market. After that case kind of settled, that's when Namco suddenly about face introduced a new pack family. I'm not sure how the Midway case uh, turned out. I didn't have a chance to look that up, and I just I didn't have that in my knowledge. So I don't know if they got some rights out of this case. They very well might have, but. Uh, they they had to keep enforcing those rights over the years as various other companies partnered with Midway and Namco to to create products uh, that featured the Pack family. So yeah, wow. this is this is the start. This is the beginning of the end of of the marriage of Pac Man and Ms. Pac Man. After decades of convoluted legal uh, actions, they would finally get a divorce because the strain was too much. And Pac-Man would remarry and have a new family. Oh, oh, that is, is, is so sordid. I didn't know there was so much <laughs> darkness in here. And speaking of family, Ronnie <laughs> Lamb on McNeil Air. And I, I forgot to write a, a bit for this. But uh, yes, back in December, uh, Ronnie Lamb and I can't remember the name of the uh, rabbi. There's a rabbi involved. Uh, showed up on PBS's McNeil Lehrer News Hour uh, and to discuss, you know, the evils of video games and how they're destroying our society, blah, 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 blah. And uh, they were uh, they were countered, if you will, by Glenn Braswell, uh, who is a executive director of the Washington-based Amusement Game Manufacturers Association. Try saying that three times fast. Uh, and, uh, you know, and they ask him straight up, you know, How are you thinking of the children and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Mr. Braswell, I think, is also somebody else. Yeah, it's Rabbi Stephen Fink. Really, your last name is Fink. Please change it. Uh, it's just not a good last name. And I'm trying to th see. And there's a Mr. Trachtman. Uh, Paul Trachtman, who is science advisor to the Capitol Children's Museum in Washington. Uh, and he's also the science editor of the Smithsonian Magazine. He says... Uh, I think there are kids for whom the experience of playing video games is not a positive experience. That doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the game. It can have a lot to do with the kid. I think that isn't only true of kids. There are people who probably don't get the best results out of playing video games in terms of the growth and their self-expression. <laughs> uh, and this is basically as a counter to uh, the rabbi saying that, you know, the kids are turning violent or whatever else. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, the level of public discourse at the time <laughs> about games and the perspective that a lot of parents are getting in the media 
about them, which is something that we can often forget about because I don't usually include all the stories about this that show up constantly. I mean, all the different legislation and ordinances to limit games. Uh, we kind of overlook them because otherwise that would be the entire show every month. But this was a nice uh, way of putting it together, and we have the whole clip for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's the age-old story. New form of entertainment comes in. It's corrupting the youth, and something has to be done. Think of the children. Yeah. And Ronnie Lamb, we've talked about her on the show before, but yeah, there's – she's a very special person, and – um there's ever if technocrats have any kind of leg to stand on she is definitely the uh poster child for that argument of <laughs> someone who doesn't know what the hell they're talking about uh getting a lot of spotlight for no reason that's right but uh you know just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't sometimes out to get you because we have x-rated games to feature in movie Video Madness, a new comedy movie about video games, will feature two games by Computer Kinetics Corporation, X-Hot Stuff and Stripper. The movie will also feature many other more mainstream games and have the final release title of Joysticks. Have you seen Joysticks? I have not. I'm aware of it, but I've never seen it. Oh, oh, uh, I, I, I just saw the trailer. And it's from from the trailer. I can surmise the following details about this cinematic <laughs> masterpiece. It is your typical. Uh, what's the genre? It's uh, a, a slobs versus snobs type of thing, right? With you know some uptight politicians trying to shut down the local arcade because it's corrupting the youth. And a bunch of horny teenagers. So it's basically mixing the horny teenager 80s comedy with mm -hmm. the uh, video game thing and trying to do everything that essentially was Porky's 2 with the right. whole censorship concept uh, storyline. What That's way too many references of Porky's movies today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and doing it in the most low-budget uh, crass, terrible humor with a group of hired punk thugs who look like cheap knockoff <laughs> versions of the Kurgan. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I shit you not. I first thought oh, it was Lord. the Kurgan. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it just looks terrible and bizarre uh. in a way that only an 80s movie could be. And I kind of want to watch it, but at the same time, I know it's going to be terrible. But the cool thing is in the background, it's all actual arcade games. Right. And it's kind of cool to see it from that standpoint. So, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Terrible movie. Uh, and, yeah. But, yeah. So, Joysticks is going to come out, uh, and it's going to have a bunch of games in it. And mm -hmm. these two games are X-rated or naughty arcade games uh, I think we mentioned yes. them once briefly a few months ago uh, there's there's nothing on screen that's going to even suggest really nudity it's it's even tamer from the graphics from what I've been able to see than uh, what was on the 2600 but <laughs> you know just because I don't think they could actually do flesh tones with the video chips that they're using right <laughs> But, you know, controversy. Speaking of controversy, first U.S. cases of video game induced seizures reported. We covered several months ago that cases of video game induced epileptic seizures had been reported in the U.K. Now the Mayo Clinic has also confirmed two cases in the U.S. Yeah. yeah. It's, I can believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, they specifically mentioned Pac-Man as one of the games that triggered one of the kids' seizures. Uh, they did not specify if it was the 2600 version or the arcade version. 
<laughs> there's 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 a loaded uh... <laughs> <laughs> exactly they do mention you know the home games had had an issue but when they talk about pac-man they don't specify which version so <laughs> you know take that with a grain of salt uh and uh, ma- and make your own uh likely decisions 2600 hey. version uh but yeah it's it, it's unfortunate and they do talk about how it's an extremely unlikely event but uh it is something that you know for the very first time you have a medium where this is possible and somebody's staring at a screen much more closely and in much closer distance than you would typically a tv so obviously you know uh, new technology new problems pretty much and speaking of new technology sega gets into robots well sega has already introduced a robot mascot in their pizza parlor cum arcade operations their latest creation the sega chan promises to bring high-tech robotics to malls and arcades with a built-in video cassette player chest-based screen emotive eyes extendable neck drawer for handing out food or literature and voice recognition to answer some questions sega chan will be the next generation of electronic amusement absolutely sure that's going to happen yeah but yeah. you know robots were robots were huge for oh, a short yeah. period here uh you know namco mappy was a robot before it was ever uh, an arcade platform game and uh you know taito did stuff with robots you had nolan bushnell founding androbot and mm-hmm. doing stuff with robots atari had ex- experimented with robots um and even smaller toys that weren't really robots in the same sense but things like alfie and like um teddy ruxpin a couple of years later like there was kind of this fad for for robotic kind of toys in this period and the japanese were at the forefront of this no doubt because uh the japanese had were already in the process of revolutionizing manufacturing with uh with robots that's probably kind of the connection here well also don't forget rocky three (laughs) <laughs> do not underestimate it when after rocky 3 in 1984 we get the tv show riptide where there's a mm. robot i mean it it was just robots were kick ass i mean we're coming off of star wars with robots now the yep, robots yep. are coming i mean but yeah hell the nes ships with a robot not by coincidence uh, sorry. My, I, I'm thinking back to my five year old self at the time, and I would have killed for a robot. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, you know, I never, I never had a, a Rob, but uh, I had one friend who had, who had bought the NES with the Rob. But I never, because this was a couple of years later. This wasn't eighty five or eighty six. It was more like eighty seven, eighty eight. Hmm. They didn't. I don't even know if it worked anymore. They never used it or anything. I never actually saw the Rob, but they still had the box in a closet in their house of the NES that they had bought with the Rob. And I was like, oh, you have the robot? Can I see it? And he's like, eh, well, it's stupid. <laughs> 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 which just, you know, which I don't know what that shows, except that, um, yes, we all thought they were cool when we were that age, but those of us who actually experienced what was available at that age were quickly disillusioned <laughs> by Extremely. their... Extremely. Uh, <laughs> extremely they never lived up to the hype and nowadays and i've looked behind me i have a little round robot that does the uh, that goes around and cleans up the floor so you know what much cooler than anything that uh we could have had in the 80s Exactly. And speaking of Carl throwing in things just because he thought they were cool, Leisure Dynamics announces crossbows and catapults. And I don't just think it was cool back then. I still own a copy of this, and I think it is one of the best games around. So have at you. No past tenses here, my friend. Yes, it's not a video game, but one of the reasons games didn't excite me until after I saw Dragon's Lair has been announced. (laughs) 
Crossbows and Catapults combines the best part of medieval fantasy, action figure playsets, and game mechanics into one of the best times you could have as a kid on a linoleum kitchen floor. So, did you ever play Crossbows and Catapults? I'm looking it up now. My instinct is no, because I don't remember it, but I'm actually looking it up now to see if, oh, like, yeah. it could have been some random thing that a friend of mine had. I There's don't... still new versions of it out today. Right. I don't think I've ever played this. Oh, my goodness. You've never played it. Oh, you poor, poor soul. So, crossbows and catapults. Here's the, the very, very quick elevator pitch. Uh, each you have two players. Each side sets up a tiny little plastic tower. You have a bunch of little plastic bricks. On the tower, you have a drawbridge, uh, and you've got a, a little characters that you can put on the top of the tower with a flag, and they're just little like army men, but medieval fantasy and you put them all around and you try to layer the bricks in front of the castle in such a way that they're going to protect the front door now the front door in the original version has through rubber bands a mechanism that if you hit the door strong enough it'll basically top them uh, blow the top off the tower and the flag on the top of the tower will go fly and mm -hmm. then you have each side gets a little crossbow also rubber bands and you can shoot little boulders at the other guy or you have a catapult where you can also shoot boulders and now you take turns after you've built your structure trying to trigger the mechanism on the other side that's going to or you just try to knock down all the characters with direct shots which will also do the trick and you do this on a linoleum floor so that the crossbow shots can go straight across the floor the catapult doesn't really matter and it was amazing. It was the best. And it, it sounds like something I would have liked. I mean, I liked taking my little plastic army men and setting them up and, you know, shooting them down with rubber bands. So, yeah. And and it in many ways, it's like a simplified kid version. Have you ever read Little Wars by uh, H.G. Mm -hmm. Wells? H.G. Wells. Yeah. My father owns a copy. Is Yeah. Uh, I, I have a copy, too. The, the, the one with the forward by Gary Gygax, which is really nice. good. Uh, and it's basically that now I, I mm -hmm. obviously didn't read that until many, many years later, but, uh, a lot of the ideas are the same. This was super fun. Uh, later versions add a lot more trigger points and make the game more complicated. Uh, but that core version from 83 just can't be understated. They also uh, release a bunch of add-ons for it, so you have extra components. I never got to play with any of those. But uh, like I said, if you're playing this at that time and you compare it with a 2600 game, there's no way you're going back <laughs> to the 2600 game as a six-year-old. You're just like, screw that noise. Um, and, Fair enough. Yeah, so this is why until I got... Uh, until I saw Dragon Slayer at my local Chuck E. Cheese, yeah, video games were not interesting. Okay, there. but sorry, just needed there to throw go. that in there since it debuts at Toy Fair. So. Nope. And that's I'm I'm out of headlines. And I just have to say for the record, it's not my fault this one's this long because I didn't choose the headlines. <laughs> I just read them. So if you have any complaints about the length of this episode, please. Please, please direct them not to me. It's not my fault this time. I feel like Han Solo. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Great reference right there. Okay. The uh, intrepid co-host has one more task before we tell everybody to click on the likes and thumbs up and subscribe on the YouTubes and uh, a buck a month on Patreon gets you all the early access stuff. But uh, one more time. What is the word of the episode? Well, I mean, I'd have to say the word of the show is crash, because 
really most of what's going on is it's the effects of the crash. It's people responding to the crash. It's people trying to capture new markets because of the crash. I mean, you could probably say that's the word of the show for any <laughs> 80s episode of the, you know, the next year. But it, it feels like that's a lot of what's happening here. Uh, if not crash, then, you know, going after preschoolers. Again, no matter how many times you say it, it still sounds wrong. <laughs> okay, everybody, you heard it here first. Uh, Alex, where can everybody find you again? They can find me at theycreateworlds.com. There's links to the podcast there. There's links to the very rarely updated blog there. Uh, and you can also find my first book, They Create Worlds, the stories of the people and companies that shape the video game industry uh, at CRC Press or major online retailers. Perfect. Alex, uh, this really has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime when it's not going to be a four hour <laughs> epic. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd love to. <laughs> okay, man. So everybody have fun. <laughs>